Hi, everyone, and welcome to our uh, first annual or first ever uh, pediatric focused conference, uh, Caring for Your Child with Neurodiversities. My name is Brenda Agnew, and I am a client liaison with Gluckstein and Nicholson Gluckstein Lawyers. Um, I'm also a former client, um, and I'm a mom of two amazing boys. My younger son has cerebral palsy uh, and other medical complexities. And so I I live this journey um, every day of caring for a child with neurodiversities. And while some days it's extremely difficult, um, it's also extremely rewarding. And so we are so uh, honored and grateful to be able to bring uh, an event to you today, although virtually, um, with some fantastic speakers. Um, we, uh, we have uh, presenters um, covering the gamut um, from across Canada and, um, from everything to talking about processing grief, um, resiliency, uh, parents as partners, the importance of peer relationships and the importance of peer supports, the importance of sports and recreation, um, you know, how to overcome um, some of the adversities uh, that we face, uh, education, advocacy. So a little bit of everything uh, for you today. Um, again, we are so, um, uh, honored to have the presenters that we have participating uh, in today's conference. Uh, it's a, a superstar list, and I still can't believe that uh, we've been able to round up everybody into one event. Um, so thank you to all of the presenters uh, that are presenting here today. Uh, we'll be introducing them um, individually before each of their presentations. And thank you uh, for joining us, for taking time out of your day today, um, to spend with us, to learn a little bit, um, to hopefully take away some um, knowledge, some insights, and um, some helpful information that you can use, whether it's in your journey as a caregiver, uh, as a parent, uh, whether it is um, working in a field with children with neurodiversities, uh, or just simply that you know uh, a family or you know someone um, that has a neurodiversity and you wanna be able to better support them um, and better understand um, some of the um, key issues uh, that come along with, with uh, that, that role um, of being involved um, as a caregiver. So uh, again, sit back, enjoy. I'm sad we can't be doing this in person, but so very happy to have all of you joining us today virtually. Um, keep your eye in the chat. We will be posting information uh, like surveys and um, question and answers. And we will also have a live Q&A that will happen immediately after our presenters are finished. That information will be in the chat, uh, some giveaways. Um, so we're gonna try to make the day uh, not only knowledgeable, but also um, a little bit of fun and engagement. So thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoy it and um, take care. Next, I have the privilege of introducing Fabiana Bikini. I don't even know where to start uh, when it comes to Fabiana. Um, we met a number of years ago and just instantly clicked. Our stories were very similar. And um, I'm so uh, grateful to count her uh, among one of my close friends. And I'm constantly um, impressed and inspired um, by her approach to life and the work that she does. Uh, Fabiana is the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, otherwise known as CPBF. She is a journalist and the published author of a book called uh, From Surviving to Thriving, A Mother's Journey Through Infertility, Loss and Miracles. In 2012, uh, Fabiana was pregnant with twin boys and she was introduced to the neonatal intensive care world after delivering at 26 weeks gestation. Her surviving twin had a long NICU stay and was later diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Fabiana's family participated on the research study of family integrated care while in the NICU, which led her to become a parent advisor at Mount Sinai Hospital, an ambassador for FICARE, and having traveled across Canada and other countries to share her experience with this model of care. She has become a strong, strong voice and advocate for, for premature babies and their families, as well as those who are living the disability journey. So welcome, Fabiana. Thank you, Brenda, for inviting me to be here today and to the Gluckstein team for the ongoing support to the families in this neurodiversity community. 
I am truly grateful to see members of our society coming together to learn and hopefully to take some time to reflect and reevaluate perceptions of disabilities. When you look at this picture, what do you see? I see a happy young boy on a zip line, excited, seeking adventure. He has a big smile on his face. And if you look carefully, a sense of pride. Still looking at the picture, what don't you see? You don't see that this happy young boy has severe dystonia and quadriplegia cerebral palsy. You don't see that his father had spent days trying to find a place that would enable his son to go zip lining and making sure it was safe. You don't see the mother crying fear that her disabled child was going on a zip line alone and exploding in pride once she let him go. There is a lot that we don't see in people's lives trajectories. We make assumptions in what we see and what we perceive to be the truth. It's only when we connect, share our stories that we truly understand the impact that each one of us can have in other people's lives. Only then we can fully support someone's journey to help them heal, accept, embrace, or change, and build resilience. Today I'll be sharing with you my personal journey that I call from surviving to thriving. It hasn't been a flat, straight path. It has been a journey full of ups and downs and heartbreaks. And I'll share how I changed my perspective and it started to embrace each and every challenge along the way. The journey started when, I, when getting pregnant didn't happen when I wanted to. After years of treatment, I was finally pregnant and delivered a healthy nine pound baby. Three years later, through another cycle of IVF treatment, I got pregnant again, this time with twins, only to find out a few weeks later that one of the twins had a heart condition and zero chance to make to birth. Hearing this prognosis broke me in every way. It was the first time that I had to face my deepest fears and accept what was. At 26 weeks gestational, I went into preterm labor and Mike was stillborn and Gabriel rushed into the neonatal intensive care unit, which became our home for 146 days. When I first saw my premature baby, I did not see a baby. I saw wires, a breathing machine, a plastic bag wrapped around his tiny body. I wondered how an entire life could be contained in only two pounds. I was terrified and barely surviving. As the weeks passed by and the beeps and alarms became part of the ICU soundtrack, I became more involved in Gabriel's care through a research study called Family Integrated Care, where parents are true partners in care and not observants. I was in the hospital for eight to 10 hours a day. I attended education sessions and medical rounds. The nurses taught me how to be a mom and see my baby pass the plexiglass and tubes and celebrate the little boy I had. It really changed my perspective. I felt unconditional love for my baby. I saw in his eyes an incredible will to live. It gave me strength to continue. The support of the medical team made me appreciate and love them. Some days were really bad, other days just bad, and some days just another day. But each and every day, I was grateful that I had him for one more day. Each day I grew stronger and able to deal with the challenges a little better. Peer support played a big role in, uh, in looking to the future with hope. Looking back, I realized 
that it was the beginning of building a muscle called resilience. Going home, the only concern was Gabriel's breathing, or that's what I thought. He was discharged on oxygen. I knew his development could be delayed, so I was very proactive from the get-go. He had early intervention and we had different therapies daily. The exhaustion caught up with me with sleepless nights, constant worry, trips to the emergency room, even CPR. The first year was foggy. I had to process the loss of my twin and rebuild a community of support while learning to navigate our complex healthcare system. But there was one thing that kept me going strong. An immense feeling of gratitude for the hospital that saved his life and the staff that held my hand through that time. And the journey continued after discharge. Gabriel did not catch up with his motor development. More and more issues were identified along the way. I knew something was wrong, but I was too afraid to ask and I was on a mission to fix it. And when he was just below two years of age, he was diagnosed with quadriplegia cerebral palsy. My entire world collapsed. It seemed so permanent. I had no idea what CP meant or how it would affect him and the dreams that I had for him and for our family. Once again, I felt broken every way. He had been put in a box with a label. A few weeks later, his osteopath said to me, he's the same boy he was yesterday. He only has a label now. She connected me with Brenda, who was the very first NICU parent I met whose child also had CP. She spent hours talking to me and all I remember was that she was a strong, a strong mom, she was fierce and she was alive. And I figured that if she could do it, I could do it. It was hope. It took me time to fully embrace the label and see my son beyond his diagnosis, just like I saw him in the ICU beyond his wires. I stopped trying to fix him and I let go of the idea of a child I thought I was going to have to fully accept the child I had. He's not broken. I had to reevaluate my own perceptions and views of disability and it all came together in 2016 when Gabriel was only four years old when we had the opportunity to go to Brazil for the Paralympic Games. It was a life-changing experience for our family to witness what is called impossible, made me believe that everything is possible. That event was everything I needed to fully embrace the life I was living and see more possibilities for Gabriel. But how do we switch our way of thinking? How do we continue to build our resilience muscle to not to feel like a victim of our own circumstances, but empowered to face what we cannot change? And I really like this quote that says, when we complain, we make ourselves a victim. We can either accept the situation, change the situation, or leave the situation. All else is madness. Well, I cannot change the fact that my son has a disability and that I am his caregiver. And one time I read a beautiful article saying that complaining, judging and blaming are addictions and addictions are learning behavior. I'm not an expert in this, but I agree that it can be unlearned. And if you want to step into our power and free ourselves from suffering, we can make a commitment to ourselves to let go of the victim. We still experience situations where suffering will occur, but we don't need to dwell in it. For me, I choose to learn from the situations and let it go every time it happens. And letting it go now is faster than it was in the past. 
because I do refuse to be a victim of my own story. I cannot change the circumstance, but I, cannot, I can change the way I look at it. For me, it's a choice. It's a choice that I make every day. I can choose to feel pity for my son. I can choose to feel sorry for myself. I can choose to feel anger because I couldn't pursue a career that I had set foot for. Or I can choose to celebrate the fact that I do have two children, even though one day a doctor said to me that I wouldn't be able to get pregnant. I can choose to be proud of myself for embarking on a new career in my 40s and that career truly fulfills my soul now and I can still choose to dream. But it does take time to change the mindset and it is a constantly change of focus. Because sometimes to this day, we get, I get caught up in a problem, in the impossibilities, in the limitations. There are a lot of people who are not supportive. A few times, doctors and therapists discouraged us. I was reminded many times about all the things that Gabriel couldn't do or would never do. A therapist once told me that Gabriel wasn't walking because I had not done enough physio, although at that time he had seven, uh, he had se uh, therapy seven days a week. A doctor once did not spend any time getting to know Gabriel, but wanted to give him an extra diagnosis just because it would be better for him. Better. Every time I left these early days appointments, my heart broke in one million pieces. And as, as I work on changing my focus, every time situations like that happen, my heart still breaks but in less pieces. We need to be more compassionate towards families and use supportive language to help them, to help us along the way. The words can make or break us. Gabriel is nine years old now, and as he grows, we face new challenges, new barriers. He often says to me now that he's the only kid in a wheelchair at his school. He says that he wants to be independent and that he wants me to take his CP away from his brain. I'm learning how to acknowledge and validate his feelings and I'm learning how to best support him and it's not always easy. So, but how do I change my focus through the challenges and adversities so I can live a fulfilled life while caring for him and empowering him? There are a few things that are important to me that I want to share with you because those are the things that really make me stronger and help me to cope with the everyday life. First one, I got rid of the box. And without the box, I celebrate my son for who he is without comparing or wanting to change him. It's also a way for him to see that CP is what he has and not who he is. The six words for CP by Dr. Uh, Rosenbaum helped me to look at CP differently and set goals and priorities based on our values as a family. This is a great way to discuss what is important for any family. I surrendered to the journey. And on the contrary of popular belief, surrender does not imply apathy or inaction. Surrender is a mental and emotional state of letting go of preconceived ideas, thoughts or beliefs or how life should unfold. And as cliche as it is, the self-care that we all, like most of us, neglect. I prefer to call caring for me the caregiver. As I get older, I think it's very important for me to be physically strong, to care for my son and his physical needs. I have to keep building a strong mind, and I do that by not engage, engaging in negative conversations or being around people who do not support us. 
and I do try my best to spend time alone, even if it's 15 days, 15 minutes a day, actually, to reconnect and ground myself. This is very important for me, and I found that to be very important. I do not accept people saying sorry for me or for my son. Saying sorry for having my child with disability means saying sorry for his very own existence. It is always a teaching moment when someone says sorry to us. I always take that opportunity. What I prefer to focus on are on the positive comments that he's come a long way, or let's try this together, or I knew he could do it. I never gave up my belief in him. He's doing well here. Let's focus now on something else. This is the therapist that we love working with. And something so simple and so important to ask. What do you like doing as a family? It really brings us together as a family. And I know people are not seeing Gabriel as a body part that has to be fixed, but see us as a family and how can we continue uh, to do things together. And the village, we all know it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a much bigger village, a full city, to raise a child with disabilities. In my village, I have people who connect me with other parents, so we know we are not alone. And I'm always in awe with the peer support. In my village, I have uh, people who empower us, who celebrate with us, who help us see possibilities. And we can now uh, choose some of the healthcare professions that we work with. And I truly deeply appreciate the fact that they work tirelessly to help us and our children. They inspire me and they challenge me often to think differently. And I'll share with you this beautiful quote from Anne Douglas' book, Parenting Through the Storm. It's from one of the parents there that says, if we stay open to the opportunities and invitations to learn and grow, we have the unique option of experiencing some good things we would never have experienced had we not been faced with the challenges brought to us by our child and I have several examples of that on a daily basis when we are open to that. I will share some of them with you because those are the most recent ones and the ones that has really created an impact in our lives. So at the beginning of COVID, this community came together. Ellen is a mom of a boy who was born with a severe disability and when Jake was alive, he, he loved music and this group would come and play for him. So she put this group online at the beginning of the pandemic and we all come together every Sunday. And this community really embraced diversity and inclusion. They you, we lifted us up. They encouraged Gabriel and other kids and youth with different disabilities to perform. And it's just absolutely inspiring. Gabriel even created an Instagram account to share his music. So that is the power of the community coming together and the effect that one person has in the world. And then there was this place called CJ Skate Park in Mississauga. This place has a great program for kids with autism. And when my son Thomas, the older son, started going there, they knew about Gabriel and they decided to create an adapted skateboard for him. So he could do the same thing as his big brother. And that is absolutely uh, incredible and fun for him. Now, this year, his school uh, has been extremely supportive. And last month, his gym teacher found a way to include Gabriel in soccer. And uh, I just want to share with you that his teacher emailed me after 
And he said, I just want you to know that it doesn't stop here. We will continue to put our best efforts forward to allow Gabriel and his peers recognize that everyone has their own path to success. One might take someone over hills, up and down stairs, and even uh, uneven roads, while another person's journey might include a ramp, elevator, and a smoothly paved path. We can all share our stories when we meet together at destination. So I cannot even express my gratitude to this teacher and the effects that he's created in the community, allowing other kids to see how to include and what is possible. So this other initiative I'm sharing the picture here with you is the Treat Accessibly. Uh, recently, Holland Blueview invited us to go to this event and see how can we all make uh, Halloween accessible to everyone by bringing a table outside the houses on the driveway so everyone can be included. Gabe was absolutely over the moon. And if you look at the picture on the left, the lady said, if the kids cannot come to my door, I will build a door um, on my driveway so the kids can come and enjoy Halloween. And obviously I, I feel emotional now. I was crying because it was so incredibly inspiring for us. And it didn't stop there because Gabriel went to school sharing his experience of just Halloween it was the first time he could actually go by himself and uh, being with his brother doing trick or treating. And uh, his teacher said, she emailed me and said she was very inspired to see Gabriel sharing that with the class. And she decided to educate the class about accessibility by using this street accessibility initiative, because this is something that is more relatable and tangible for the kids as they are only in grade five, four, they are nine years old. So she uh, got 25 of the lawn signs, the treat accessibly signs, one for each student in the class for them to participate in the program. As a class, they will be creating posters for media literacy to educate people about what treat accessibly is all about and ways to make trick or treating accessible at their homes. This is one teacher. Can we imagine the ripple effect of this initiative around the school and the community? So all these big moments followed by the everyday random acts of kindness makes me feel truly grateful. I really have gratitude as a way of living. Everything I do comes from a place of gratitude and I'm grateful to all these people and experiences they create for Gabriel and for our family. It transforms how I see the world. It gives me strength and courage, especially on the challenging days, because there are many. It makes me believe that the world is a good place. And you remember the happy boy in the beginning of my presentation, that is Gabriel. And if you're asking me, how come I let him go on zip lining? I will tell you, it was not because they convinced me that it was safe. It was because when I was crying, scared that he was going to do this on his own, or own and not tend them as we had previously arranged, he looked at me in my eyes and said, Mama, this is the only thing I can do by myself. I had no choice but surrender. So this is my word, my journey from surviving to thriving. How I keep building resilience besides all that that I just shared. I will tell you that is just by being his mom. Gabriel is the teacher I was waiting for my entire life. Here is his speech in September at the Youth Day Global. We belong, we believe and we become. We are, and we have to work together to make things right. We shall never tears, no cry for help, and accept no rewards. Nothing shall slow us down. Nothing but peace, hope, and faith. It's 
played to be all together, celebrating the use of our different abilities and talent. For me, it's important to include people with visible and invisible disabilities and everything. This is how we create a world without stigma and where everyone feels included. Many times, people tell me what I cannot do, and I'm sure people sometimes discourage me too. We're doing something you really want. But don't give up, keep trying. Find us to encourage you and believe in your dreams and your song. This way, we all feel empowered to do anything. I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you everyone for being here today and for listening to my story. It is my pleasure next to welcome Jeff Thiessen. Jeff is a Canadian and world record holder in several track and field events for persons with physical disabilities. He has competed in three Paralympic Games and several world championships, winning a number of medals. Jeff is always admired for his ongoing commitment to improving the lives of people with disabilities and is a huge advocate for um, recreation and sport uh, for people living with a disability um, and uh, is known to often say there is a sport for every body. Uh, Jeff is the executive director of Parasport Ontario and the owner of Disability Today Publishing Group. Hi, I'm Jeff Thiessen, Executive Director of Parasport Ontario, and President of Disability Today Publishing Group, and a three-time uh, Paralympian, and I, I'm just thrilled to be asked to, to speak with you, to you, I guess, um, uh, today uh, about my experience, my story, um, how sport really played into um, the directions life took me, or I, I took life, uh, uh, maybe, and really... Um, you know how that began and, and where those influences were so it, it's it's important to say that um my story starts uh, in the 70s uh, i lost both hands in you know electrical accident as an 11 year old and uh playing where i shouldn't have been playing <laughs> of course i was not an electrician at 11 years old you know i often get uh told you're so lucky to be alive. And, and yes, um, after sustaining 27,000 volts of, uh, of electricity at, at once, I, uh, I am lucky to be alive, but I often, you know, throw the joke back. I, I'm just hard to kill. Maybe that's, that's more it. But anyway, I, um, 40 some years as a, an amputee, double arm amputee. I'm a prosthetic wearing uh, individual, uh, both sides and use the traditional they call hooks or terminal devices just because they've well that's all there was in 1977 and 78 mostly um but that's what really works for me and and, and that, that's been an important component of um managing adapting to to life without hands um kind of getting the job done and, and being as functional and as, as independent as possible. But of course I didn't start that way when I was starting to learn them, learn how to use them. And at that same time, uh, I, I was a very active uh, kid. I played just about any sport I could get my hands on, so to speak. And after my injury, I, I really didn't think I was ever gonna return to, to the sports world, which was um, you know, a huge sort of blow to my identity, self-esteem, um, with all else that comes with uh, learning to live life uh, differently after a traumatic injury. But my dad had a bit of a different idea. We, uh, we came from a rural part of Southern Ontario, so we had that uh, farm, farm boy mentality. And, was, you know, Jeff, if you can still skate, you can still play hockey. And I was really resistant to that dad you know the stick and the tying of the skates and it wasn't something he was hearing or, or or listening to so i remember for months him working on an adapted hockey stick and part of that included holes drilled in the shaft but on a more sophisticated level he worked with a, a machinist in town and built this funny looking contraption that when it the end of, of the hockey stick, a, a ball and socket. And I remember the Saturday morning when it was time to 
return to the rink and, and join the team again. And, and I was terrified. Um, <laughs> I would say he pulled me out from under the bed than, than out of the bed on that, that Saturday morning. But what my dad had done beyond building that funny looking hockey stick was ensured that I was going to be welcomed back and accommodated at the arena. Um, he spent some time with the administrators and coaches and other parents. So that was not going to be um, an obstacle or a barrier of showing up that, that morning. And, and I think that that was key to, to the success of um, one year uh, back in, it was peewee minor hockey. Um, and it, I mean, it was successful in the sense that we did it. Um, again, there were a lot of things that left me quite uncomfortable and, 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 also, I was just a year into being a, a youth with a, with a disability, but um, the, the confidence that that year gave me is really what set the stage or the foundation for much of what I'm <clears throat> modestly like to, to say what I've accomplished in, in my life. And, and that includes three podiums at three different Paralympic Games, three different Paralympic medals and, and a world record uh, in Seoul, Korea in 1988 to, to go with that. And I, I attribute it wholeheartedly to physically that funny looking hockey stick, but that support that, that my parents um, uh, 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 provided me and, and the community around that, that supportive um, atmosphere or environment for me to to thrive and you know again back to the 70s there was no such thing as youtube <laughs> or internet for that matter or even manuals or guides for um you know what to, how to raise an amputee child um, my parents really had to be uh, the advocates that they they needed to be for me to, to to find our way and then there was support through our prosthetists and and the war amps uh, even at that time great support for us but managing through life's challenges and attitudes and perceptions um they really took the bull by the horn so to speak and i often say one of the greatest gifts that they gave me uh was learning how to be my own best self advocate that I would know what I needed or how I was going to do things really better than than anyone else based on lived experience and they were always very encouraging of that so you know back to that hockey stick it, it really gave me the confidence to believe that if, if I could go back and play hockey again maybe I could do anything and I mean for me it was hockey for other parents, children, it can be something totally different. It could be art, it could be music, um, but it's, it's that, that sports world that, that I knew and that's, that's what it was for me. So I, I've talked a, a lot over the years about the importance of what I call small victories and you know, learning to use two artificial arms again at, at age 11, 12, 13 into my teens was certainly a challenge. And, and it was the, the, the small accomplishments that were humbling, um, how to ride a bike again, how to use a fork and knife, how to, um, uh, you know, the list goes on, uh, button up a shirt. And, you know, in looking back over the years, I, I've really come to appreciate how important those, those small victories are. Um, they, they were painting a bigger picture, really, for, for success. And, um, of course, it was not that easy for a kid to get excited about learning how to ride a bike again when it's a teenager. Um, but, again, knowing that, that was the, those were the, the stepping stones for me to become uh, a Paralympic athlete, uh, a publisher, a writer, um, and even – I. I I like to fancy myself as a good, good dad, uh, based on understanding that, um, you know, having a goal, your eyes on the prize, uh, those are important things. Uh, but, but that cliche of, of the journey and not the destination, it, it, I, I really found it to be true and really impactful uh, in, in my life. And uh, I guess that first hockey stick was a, a stepping stone to that. I've been asked what my Paralympic uh, career contributed to, um, I guess, life, life in general. And it, it was a really special time in my life and a very focused time, of course, uh, 
um, goals and objectives. Um, that's what that's what it was all about. But it for me, it gave some sort of purpose. When people ask me often, why, how, why did you become a Paralympic athlete? I, I was a good athlete, uh, and um, track is where I, I landed, and I, I'd heard about my potential <laughs> so much, so I kind of wanted to put an end to that conversation and, and see what that potential was, but it, it, it was a, a playing field that was was leveled for me. I could still run uh, a little bit differently with artificial arms, but um, it was a, a place or a stage for me to push myself, um, dangle a carrot uh, for me to, to chase, uh, and an opportunity to, to succeed at whatever level, mm-hmm. even if I didn't get to that Paralympic level. Um, again, there were those check boxes and milestones uh, along the way. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I think I learned a lot of terrific lessons as a, an elite athlete, probably would have learned them in, in real life at, uh, anyway, but learned them differently uh, as an athlete. And I, I think one takeaway for me, and it, and it seems to have um, application to, to many aspects of my life, is, is really focusing on me. And I, and I don't mean that in a <laughs> narcissistic, you know, uh, selfish, self, self-centered way, but we all have a real tendency to compare and uh, for me as a kid with uh, with different hands than anyone it was uh, always an opportunity to compare how I couldn't do things like like others have, have done and what I learned on the track is that really on any given day um, the best you can do is the best you can do and then really what I'm saying is we only have control of our, ourselves. And I, I remember competing in, in Seoul, uh, Korea in, in 88. Um, and that was the, kind of the peak of my career. And I, and I went to Seoul as the favorite to win the, the 400 meter track I had, uh, event. And I also qualified for the 100 and the 200 um, and ran them, of course, and ran them against the same athletes that later in the event I'd be racing against in, in the 400. And I was beaten um, pretty handily by them. Um, I had forgotten that that's really not why I was there. I was there for my event, but self-confidence drained pretty quickly. And, and I remember being on the starting line, literally, for the, the 400. And up on the jumbotron, I, I saw myself and it, it was like looking in a really big mirror. And, and at that point, when I was uh, feeling that lack of confidence because the athlete to my left and uh, the Polish athlete and the German athlete and the athlete from China and on the other side, the British athlete, French athlete um, had beat me in early events, I realized I have no control over what they're doing today. It was just about me and what I would do that day. And and I've carried that, that with me that, um, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's important to know what's going on around you, but um, what we do is, is often most, it should be most important to us. It, it's been a life of, of doing things differently, of course. I mean, using that example of uh, uh, buttoning up my shirt, I typically do that while my shirt is off of me <laughs> on the bed where I can manipulate my arms a lot, lot better to do that and then, and then put it on like a t-shirt. But, I mean, that's something I needed to get comfortable with over the years in that um, I'm just not doing things like everybody else. And I remember a, an opportunity I had to, to help a gentleman who lost his hands, young adult, I, I guess, uh, electrical accident like me, both hands, I think above the elbow like me. And he was looking for some help. And I said, sure. It was by phone. He was from Philadelphia, I think. And I said, well, where do you want to start? He said, I I would just like to have a cup of coffee in the morning with my wife. And I said, okay, what's the problem? (laughs) And he said, I, I, you know, I grab the coffee mug and and right away it it, it tilts and spills, you know, nearly burning myself. It's embarrassing. And my wife has to clean clean up the coffee. And, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting this scenario. Um, I said, how are we grabbing the, the coffee cup? Why is it spilling? He says, well, I, I grab it by the handle and um, it, it, not, it just right away, it rotates in, in my hook. 
And I know from years of experience, um, you know, beer steins and coffee mugs and martini glasses with those thin stems and, and thin handles are not made for our prosthetic devices that we wear. We, we really don't have a thumb <laughs> and all of those require an opposable thumb. So I said, okay, uh, but why are you grabbing it by the handle? Because typically we'll just open the up wide enough and grab it around the barrel of the glass or the mug. He said, because that's the way everybody drinks a cup of coffee. And I said, okay, well, let's think about why everybody does that. First of all, first of all, we're talking about everybody with hands and that handle is there to prevent people from burning their hands on the mug. We don't have that problem anymore. So you don't need the handle. Um, let's just do it differently. Grab around the, the barrel of the mug. And, and I think that might solve your problem. <laughs> and it did. And, and we worked on a lot of other things too. But, you know, the point of all of that is we want to quickly gravitate to do things the way everybody else does them. And, and sometimes that's just not the best way for, for us. And, and uh, being comfortable with that, I think, is, uh, is really important. Certainly was was for me. I talked about advocacy. I'd also like to talk about uh, peer, um, a peer network, uh, appropriate peer networks. Um, back in the 70s, uh, my parents looked for another arm, double arm amputee as, as hard and long as, as they could to, to give me someone to uh, relate to, to, to help me learn, learn the ropes. And there weren't many of us, uh, and there still aren't, um, but they, they found this gentleman um, who went by the handle of Handy Andy, <laughs> and he was a, a carpenter in Windsor, and um, we were a lot of years uh, apart, and nothing against Andy, he was, you know, presented a little bit disheveled, and I remember him uh, arriving at the hospital when I was still, still in the hospital after my injury, and um, maybe I didn't know what Tobacco Road and and Whiskey River smelled like back then, but I think I, I recognize something different about it. And he didn't have a lot to offer me. And, and uh, it, it was a difficult interaction because that's what I was set up to think the future um, held. And again, no disrespect um, for Mandy's uh, willingness to, to help, but we were just so different. And uh, I, I've realized that appropriate, uh, age appropriate, lifestyle appropriate peer support is 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 so key when when we can find it. Um, I think in the years to come, I, I realized that well, I I didn't aspire to be to be a carpenter, but um, I I just came to know that there were many other opportunities uh, available for me, and and, that, and that's how I I pursued pursued life at the uh, direction or help of, of my parents, for sure. They were always emphatic about opening different doors for me to try. And, and I can always just remember, just try it, Jeff, just try it. And, uh, you know, some things didn't, didn't stick, uh, but some things really did and, and kind of found my path through um, life as a, as a journalist and then to here at, at Paris Port Ontario. And, just to, to kind of wrap up uh, and share with you what, what we do here, we truly do believe that there is a sport for every body, and we emphasize that body part. And um, that, that's what we do on a daily basis, finding uh, pathways to sport or physical activity, or recreational activities um, for people with unique bodies and, you know, situations and circumstances in, in life. And, um, you know, from sledge hockey to wheelchair basketball, to yoga, to rock climbing, to adaptive circus arts, to bocce, to sitting volleyball, and the list goes on and on. We, we truly believe we can, uh, we can help those that, that want to find fun, friendships, fitness, uh, in, in sport, uh, physical activity, um, the people and experts and programs and clubs that, that can help. So, um, yeah, I, I would say as the, my promotional soapbox and uh, marketing hat. Please, uh, please give us a call if, if we uh, if we can be of some help in directing your family, your child, 
um, to a sport or activity that uh, may be of interest and of, of choice for them. So I guess it's always good to end with how to get in touch with us. Uh, parasportontario.ca is our, our website. And again, we've got a, a team of, of folks here that uh, are ready and willing and able to help. So um, pleasure being part of your morning or afternoon um, uh, of this day. And uh, yeah, please, uh, please rely on us if, if you need us. Thanks so much.
my pleasure to welcome Rachel Martins to our program today. Um, I've got to know Rachel um, a number of years ago and really through the social media world, um, through the virtual world, and then had the pleasure of actually connecting with her in person um, a couple of years ago at a conference in Ottawa. Um, and thankfully we've stayed in touch um, I've been able to work on a couple of projects with Rachel um, and have come to really appreciate her amazing sense of humor, um, her passion for life, her advocacy for others. Um, and I, I think you're really gonna enjoy um, her talk today. And so a little bit about Rachel. Um, Rachel Martins um, is a mom with 14 years experience caring for her disabled son who sadly passed away. Um, Luke was uh, an amazing child and uh, I loved um, keeping up with him and his adventures on social media. Uh, Rachel currently works as a research engagement strategist for Can Child Center for Childhood Disability Research and Kids Brain Health Network, assisting students through the Family Engagement and Research course. She has a passionate interest in child health policy in Canada from a disability lens and has had the privilege to partner in the ongoing work, which included three opportunities to connect with the United Nations in both Geneva and New York. She takes regular opportunities to speak to families about the status of federal and provincial policies uh, here in Canada. Um, so I hope you enjoy her talk. I know that you will. So thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy and honored actually to be here. I wanted to talk a little bit today about grief. Now, there's a lot to be said from a wide variety of experiences. Um, from birth to in some cases uh passing away as well too and i kind of feel like we have a way of kind of putting our foot in the door on the subject and we we build each other up in those really vulnerable moments but we don't really kind of talk about it out loud to some degree anyways i wanted to kind of i don't know touch on a few things i'm not going to solve any big conversations today, but I thought I'd kind of reflect a bit on my own life, but also share maybe some things that I've learned from other families who walk some of the similar paths that I have as well too. So for now, I think uh, it would be a really great start to introduce my family. So help on the right is my husband, Nick, and the uh, Smiling little guy in the in the middle was my son Luke. Uh, Luke made it to um, almost to age fourteen. He was born with a really rare chromosome disorder called mosaic trisomy twenty two, which means his twenty second chromosome, which is attributed to growth, um, he had a third copy of it, and so he ended up being quite a little guy for most or for all of his life, really. Um, it's it's kind of a it's a challenging um, diagnosis in the sense that there's really no like zero clear path. The best I can do is say that um, some kids pass away at birth. Um, some kids are giant question marks uh, in terms of what sort of a prognosis they have and other people have maybe a few complications at birth and then live really long lives. And so it's kind of, it's touch and go, but we kind of worked our way through the idea that um, there's really no way to make huge plans. So we uh, we tried to kind of carve our own path and just work with what we had along the way with the best information possible. And some of that came with really hard conversations, but that's why I love this Brene Brown quote so much. The idea of uh, being vulnerable isn't about like winning or losing. It's about the courage to show up when you can't predict or control the outcome. Sometimes it's just about putting that information out there and just letting it kind of float in the universe. And I think that's kind of what today is a bit about too, is just to take some thoughts and just move them out there or something to ponder. And um, that's what's been so interesting about learning during the pandemic is seeing so many people doing that and writing or sharing their story and just allowing us to take a moment to pause and learn. Um, I think that the world needs more of that right now. So um, with him, it, it's been a year now since he passed away and I've been working through a lot of my own um, experiences, uh, things like post-traumatic stress from the experience of him passing away. Um, I found one thing as well too, actually, that um, I, had, I, I was lucky enough to have a lot of people in my life who kind of surrounded me with a lot of love during that really awkward time. 
these were other medical families as well too who um, likely will be um, seeing a similar path in terms of um, outliving their kids and some not so much but still have walked their own complex paths and uh, there came to a point where like my son passed away uh, a week or so before his um, 14th birthday and so we ended up having kind of an ice cream birthday for him um, it was a socially distant um, thing in, in my yard where we had cake and ice cream and people just uh, it was an opportunity to just I don't know be together and just and that's what he always loved about times at going to Dairy Queen because it wasn't about the ice cream per se he'd have maybe like a few bites and that's that but it was things like I'm with my mom and my dad I'm get to put my feet on the table sometimes then my mom tells me no um, but it was one of those things where he he valued being together and so we wanted that day to kind of honor that as well too and so we did and I've been talking with some of my friends that day people like other complex parents um a thought kind of came to mind and I kind of put it out there and I said I'm, I'm really going to have to write this experience down for you guys aren't I um, because it's actually at one point, one of my mom friends who was there gave a bunch of us um, hand embroidered, um, I want to say napkins, but I can't remember the word, um, handkerchiefs. And what ended up happening with that was just, it was going to be this common bond that we shared that when, you know, when we go to other people's houses and if they have to have moments like this as well too that we would have this common connection with these handkerchiefs and I thought <laughs> I really am going to have to write down these experiences because um, I think there's kind of an innate fear to some degree about really saying a lot of these things out loud be it um, at the end or be it at the beginning or, or the in-between um, so I've been kind of trying to do that in in a lot of other ways um, because I think that there, there's so much about just creating a balance and actually this picture I took myself um, on a work trip to France that was on a random building um, there's lots of um, street art in, in various uh, parts of downtown Paris and this one just really resonated with me in the sense that I think that we we do a lot to kind of um, stack things chaotically in our minds and just make sure that that big um, chaotic Jenga game kind of sticks together and um, and that's understandable but I, I think um, now is a time where we can kind of sit and just talk a little bit out loud about this so in some cases there are going to be conversations we have here today that um, well it might get awkward um, it might feel awkward sometimes uh it might also be important to kind of decompress after this take five minutes for yourself breathe do something happy eat some ice cream there's no rules here but I, I just wanted to say that out loud and if you do need um some support after this as well too please reach out to someone you love <sighs> now i don't want this today to be something where someone says it's all in your head like I'm not gas, I don't want to gaslight anybody's experiences here. And my experience is my own. Um, I do try to share a few things that I've learned from other people, but at the same time, I'm not here to deny you um, any sort of validation that you so rightfully deserve in terms of these experiences. Um, I'm not going to um, blast positivity and tell you that that's the only feeling that you um, are allowed to have right now because that's not right either. Um, I watched a really interesting TED talk a while back uh, where a lady was talking about um, the notion of positivity and how it can sometimes send people in a different direction. And that in order to not feel things, she said, uh, in order, if you're going to go through life to avoid um, feeling pain, that that is the goal of somebody who's not alive. Um, that pain is a part of the entire human experience. So I'm not here to just say, think only positive things, the end. That's not my story here today. But I felt like with a lot of these experiences, I, I really did need to kind of bring a little bit of context and not think about these things so much in the chaotic waves that they tend to be, but to kind of frame and learn from all of the things that 
happened to me, all of my experiences um, from just the day to day to the larger dramatic stuff and kind of try to figure out whether or not I can calm some of the, that choppy sea and, and make sure that I can kind of hold my own self together and just to learn from those experiences. I find that grief is still fairly poorly defined. Actually, there's one study um, that talked about um, how common it is within the world of um, parents who child or who parents who raise an autistic child. And some just minor notes from that ended up being that um, it does happen, but it's just important not to get stuck in it. Um, but and what well, the and that's an important space to acknowledge. But at the same time, um, I think we need, there's a lot more learning to be had. We kind of like put that foot in the door, but we don't really like jump right into it. We just kind of go back to swimming as best we can in the experience. So, how do we define it? Um, I thought a bit about this in a capacity, as you can see, I have kind of a water theme here going today. <laughs> uh, basic definition of grief is that grief is a response to loss. Um, from the technical side of things, they tend to talk about it from uh, obvious um, uh, physical loss or someone passing away. But I think that there is a lot of different types of experiences where we find grief, um, be it um, a new diagnosis, um, See, having a, challenges with our uh, kids being um, unable to join in certain social circles or things like that. Like there, there's a variety of stories here in terms of how we experience grief. And as I mentioned, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but grief is a reaction to a spectrum of experiences. As, as you can see, there's health decline, think, um, new diagnosis, anticipatory grief. All of these things have uh, a, a different um, stage or phase in life. How I envision the experience, now we have a lot of older ideas about things like five stages of grief and things like that. And those don't tend to really fit so well within the framework of what we're talking about here today. But um, this is kind of what I wanted to express here. Um, and apparently my video is not working here today, but I will talk a bit about um, this particular theory of grief that basically says that um, this is you, the outer circle, and the inner circle is your grief and the fact that it doesn't um, change per se, but you grow as a human being that you develop and you shift. It's always there, but it's kind of more a matter of developing a relationship with the fact and honoring that it's, it's always going to be a part of you, but you get better at walking with it. Um, Megan Devine is definitely one of my favorite authors that I went to uh, when my son passed away because I found a real challenge in uh, uh, finding resources about who to talk to um, after my son passed. Um, there's a lot about infant loss, and that's fair. Um, there's a lot about losing a parent, absolutely fair. Um, about losing a teenage disabled child, not so much. Um, I had a lot of really great intentioned people send me things that were about infant loss and it just, I don't know, it didn't, it didn't sit right. But I, I think that there's so much to be said about what people see uh, and how they frame um, the experience from the outside and when we have these moments for ourselves. And I think that as, as she mentions here, People think all, the whole point of grief is to get out of it as quickly as possible, that grief gets a narrow window to be expressed and that you're just kind of expected to just move on. And I think to some degree, we kind of do that to ourselves. Um, but I think that there is something to be said about being in that moment um, and, and really just kind of letting the, those feelings go and letting them happen, but also, um, considering the other dynamics of the relationship, but I'll actually continue on to talk about that soon, for, soon enough. Uh, we, we demand a lot from the world about just keep swimming, that that's just it, like just, just do it. Um, I, I don't think that that's entirely the process that we want to honor here. I think there, there, there is 
moments where, yeah, you, you just have to do that. But I, I think that we can stop in the moment and really kind of, I don't know, we, we can feel the feelings, we can be in the water, um, but I and how we are in the water can depend on the experiences that we have as well too. Uh, sometimes we are Olympic swimmers who are just there, um, just moving through the water and cutting through it with great precision. And that's great. I think that those moments are where we are at our best, just getting done what we need to get done. Um, sometimes we hang out in the shallows with our kid um, or kids. And sometimes it's just about being together, despite the fact that certain circumstances just really rough but you are together and that in and of itself, you're both kind of learning to um, be in the water together. Uh, sometimes there are times where we feel kind of submerged by everything and those moments need to be validated as well too. I think a step in the right direction here is that there will always be water, that it's always going to happen that it's just a part of that, that the experience that we have, but I think it's important to also um, honor all of those phases upon which we are, we do find ourselves kind of in that, that grief space or in the, in the water. Um, but what, what do we do was the next phase to consider. And I think that there's something to be said about learning to float. Um, and just kind of be in the moment. Now, learning to float comes in different types of ways too. Sometimes we are the people on the left. We are supported by others, someone, particular circumstance that you, you name it. We um, find ourselves being lifted slightly out of the water and we can take a moment to enjoy the experience that is the sunshine on our face with just a, a toe or a hand in the water. Um, just feeling guided, not necessarily needing a particular direction to go, but just to float. Um, sometimes we find ourselves with enough strength to just be in the water, to feel the feelings, to just have enough um, strength to help hold your head above, to breathe, but also to feel the experiences that come with being in the water as well too. And sometimes those moments are just, just by ourselves and they have to be. For myself, my grief relationship um, means that right now I'm walking on the beach. Um, I honor the fact that that water will always be a part of my environment. But sometimes I can also say that it's a matter of being detached from it as well too. It's there. Um, I don't always have to address it, but I honor the fact that it has a space that it's supposed to. Um, but, and sometimes that relationship can have a bit of humor as well too, to some degree. I, I thought this quote was just really, um, it just made me think about being salty as well too. I think sometimes the, 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 it can give us strength to have an attitude, to have strength in whatever way that you need it to as well. Um, because really, um, if we don't acknowledge the relationship that we have with grief, um, then we're not really kind of fully understanding what it means to, to love somebody so deeply, um, and the strength that it takes to move through so many of these processes and still to continue on, um, no matter the path that we still find our way to through new diagnoses, we find our way through um, fear of the unknown. It's when we can find the people around us as well too, who can help support us through these processes. They become the life preserver when you feel like you can't um, keep your hand above the water. Um, because it's sometimes when we do this alone and actually I read, we're talking about water analogies. I found uh, a description about how when we insist on struggling through water, um, it's a matter of trying to grab, we try to grab onto it as we um, try to struggle to get our head above water. And that's the difference between trying to do this on your own versus just letting your body do what it needs to do sometimes and, and float. But when you are struggling and trying to cut at, grab at the water, you're not going to do anything. But when you can 
um, use the help of others, or just to use the resources that you have in the moment, that's when you float. That's when you um, take when you that's when you take those moments that you need. And I, I just really hope that today becomes a moment where we can kind of just just think about and name the experiences that we have in terms of um, really giving this giving this relationship the name that it is. It is grief, and it's okay to just let it be a a space in your world, just not to live entirely in it is my big lesson that I wanted to talk about with today. And I really hope that um, we can have more conversations about this and really just give it the attention that it deserves. And I think that it's become all the more space in the pandemic to um, have deeper conversations like this. And I think that moving forward in the idea of building back better, some of that's going to come with understanding um, aspects of our family stories that, that we don't necessarily um, give enough space for before. And perhaps we can start sharing our story with a deeper breadth than we ever have done previously. And I look forward to seeing more stories come out um, through the rest of the time we have um, helping our kids through um, this big global process. And just for you to all as well know that you're not alone through these experiences as well, as well too. And thank you very much for having me. Up next, we have Jan Marin and Brenda Agnew discussing the topic of advocacy. Jan was called to the Ontario Bar in 2010. Her personal injury practice focuses on medical malpractice and professional liability. She's on the board of directors of the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, as well as the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, bringing her legal expertise to an organization dedicated to helping parents, clinicians, and educators who work with premature babies. She is a passionate advocate for her clients and their families. Brenda is a dedicated mother to two boys, Chase and McLean. Her youngest son, McLean, has severe cerebral palsy and profound hearing loss due to a condition known as connectoris, which results from untreated jaundice. As a former Glexine client herself, Brenda acts as our client liaison to support and advise clients and their families throughout their case. She has created resources for families who share a similar journey and builds community relationships with numerous local charities. She is also an active member of several volunteer organizations, engagement committees, and as a trustee on her local school board. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Brenda Agnew, and I am a client liaison and a former client of Gluckstein Lawyers. And I also have with us today Jan Marin, who's one of our senior lawyers um, with our firm. And we will be speaking to you um, around the topic of advocacy, uh, sharing some ideas, some lessons, and some resources that we hope you can uh, benefit from and take away uh, from our talk today. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, over to Jan. All right. So I know that many of you as caregivers uh, have to be advocates on a daily basis. So Brenda and I don't intend to give you a full on lesson about all that it means to advocate for your child because you guys are the experts and you certainly have those skill sets out of necessity that this is part of the process. Um, but we, what we do wanna do is give you some resources, um, maybe give you a little bit of information that you didn't have or things that are available to you that you didn't realize were available. Um, we also don't intend actually this morning in our presentation to speak too much about the legal system, the civil system, which is 99% of what I do in, in my career, um, because I think a lot of people are aware of that. But we do wanna give you a high level sense of what it is that we do so that if anyone is interested or has questions, um, you can 
call us and ask your questions. So we do a lot of birth and pediatric injury cases. Um, and certainly I know that this doesn't apply to everyone. There are lots of different uh, reasons um, that children have neurodiversities. Um, one may be an injury, another could be you know something that happened during the birth, but there's many, many other things. Um, and you may not know. And so one of the things that we, uh, like to do for prospective clients, in fact, not just clients who have hired us and we're well into the process of a lawsuit, but is provide some answers. Because so often, if genetics aren't the answer, if there's no concern um, that you know there's something underlying going on with your child and there's just never been any answer given to you of why your child has a neurodiversity, um, you might have questions. And that's one thing that we do as part of our process. The very first step, in fact, is taking a look at medical records and giving families an answer of whether there is the possibility or it's completely something outside of a medical legal issue. So for example, sometimes parents uh, with children who have CP uh, don't realize that their child had uh, a stroke in utero. They never had that information. And that's certainly typically, in most cases, not something that's caused by the error of any healthcare provider. But having that information can be important and can also uh, just give you perhaps some closure. And I, I feel like information's power regardless. So having that information can be really helpful. And in some cases, there are issues with the management of a labor, uh, issues also with the management um, of your baby. If, for example, and Brenda's going to probably just briefly touch on this, if your baby developed jaundice or if your baby became hypoglycemic, so wasn't feeding properly, there can be injuries that occur because of these things. So there's lots of different things that can happen particularly during infancy that can result in injury. Um, and also, you know, there are cases where children um, at a young age suffer a brain injury uh, for many different reasons. And we can help you navigate some of, some of that. We also have available, and Brenda can maybe mention this a little bit more, but a guide for not just our clients, but for all parents managing um, children, not just with neurodiversities, but any type of special needs or injury, which helps uh, parents and caregivers access resources within their community. So that's something we have available to people um, that they can just reach out to our office. Um, but certainly there's no cost to you in hiring a lawyer from day one. Um, we will look at the case and give you our sense of, of what we think the next step should be. And that initial consultation will not cost you one cent. And, you know, even if it's not something we can help with, we're always happy to have a conversation. So I'll just, I think I'll leave my comments there on, on our civil work and let Brenda maybe talk about her experience with us. And then we can talk a little bit more about advocacy in the healthcare system. And we'll also touch upon educational advocacy. Perfect. Thanks, Jan. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to, um, I wanted to share a little bit about um, my experience and why uh, I'm so supportive of us having this conference today. Um, and there are people I'm sure who are joining who, um, who I do know or who know me. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, um, I am a mom to two boys and my younger son, McLean, uh, has cerebral palsy. And unfortunately, um, his cerebral palsy is as a result of untreated jaundice, as Jan had mentioned, jaundice. Um, McLean is a surviving twin. He was born at 29 weeks um, and five days gestation, um, unfortunately, after his twin brother passed away. And we spent about three and a half months in the NICU. And it was unfortunately during that time that he sustained his injury. Um, but what I always talk to people about when we talk about advocacy is I really am the best I think, example of a reluctant advocate. Um, it wasn't something that, you know, I've always been someone who spoke up for, um, you know, people who didn't have a voice and I always had no problem sharing my perspective or being the person to put their hand up. Um, but it's very, very different, I think, when you're actually um, in that situation for your child who is in, you know, a medical situation um, and, and is having some complexities. And so I really uh, was a reluctant advocate. It started almost from day one being in the NICU um, and just really having to um, 
you know, ask questions, get answers, find out what was happening. Um, and because unfortunately, um, I think as many people on here will, will attest to, the information is not always free flowing. Parents are not always treated um, as equal partners in healthcare. And um, so, you know, I really had to get my advocacy legs, if you will, um, set up and on and ready to go, which was very difficult um, as a tired new mom with a 19 month old at home who'd been through um, obviously a fairly tragic situation and now had a child uh, going through a lot in the NICU. Um, I wish I could say that, you know, the tired has gone away, um, but I already started my conversation today by letting Jan know that I was, <laughs> I was struggling a little bit today. It was, a, I'm, I'm a tired mom again today. Um, and, you know, so uh, I think it's really important to, to speak with other families um, because we are tired and we have a lot going on and we are very emotional and our, our plates are very full. Um, and so we do really stumble along the way. Again, most of us, if not all of us, have never thought we were going to find ourselves in a situation we needed to, to have advocacy and not little advocacy, you know, advocating things like the medical system or the health or the um education system, those are not things to be taken lightly. Um, they're big things to tackle. And so, you know, I really, um, when I say stumbling along the way here, I really have stumbled along the way. Um, you know, try to find my footing, um, try to find the best ways to help my family, help my son, help other families that may be experiencing challenges with our, our system and our society. Um, but it's never smooth. And Anyone who makes advocacy look easy um, is doing just that. They're making it look easy because it's not easy. Um, and so, you know, uh, I really had to, and I'll talk a little bit later about lessons learned, but um, you really do have to stumble along the way uh, to find the right path and to find the people that can help you um, to, to navigate the things and, and fight, if you will, for what you need. Um, and, and one thing I do want to really um, highlight here is the importance of reaching for help. And this has been something that has been very, very key for me um, in all the work that I've been doing or personal advocacy is finding an ally, finding, um, so, you know, this is the tie-in with Glexine um, and it's an organic tie-in. Uh, you know, when we realized something had happened uh, with our son, we couldn't do this alone. I don't know the medical system. I don't know how to navigate um, you know, the legal system. And so you reach out for help. And whether that's a lawyer in our situation with this, whether you're reaching out to, um, you know, a director of education, you're reaching out to your neighbor, you're reaching out to a, a local official, whoever it is, you need to be able to reach out for help um, because you can't do this by yourself. Um, and um, you'll be more successful in your efforts if you, if you get some help and you'll be hopefully less burnt out. I'm going to pass it over to Jan and Jan's going to talk about some specifics um, as it pertains to healthcare advocacy strategies. Yeah, so this is a big one because there can be lots of different facets of healthcare, whether it's um, getting treatment in the community, getting services um, with your family physician, obtaining a specialized pediatrician, uh, seeing developmental pediatricians, getting actually specialist consultations. So all of these things are are really heavy and sometimes require a lot of knowledge to be able to to work your way through all these things. Even uh, personally, whether it comes to my own healthcare, my kids' healthcare, um, I often uh, have to think about how I'm going to approach various things um, and make sure we're getting the best care possible. So I know as a mom uh, that this can be heavy, even with kids that don't have special needs or neurodiversities. So that additional added layer of special um, specialized knowledge that as a caregiver you require, but that you also want your healthcare team to have is so important. Um, and to not just be seen as another number, uh, another patient on that day and really to feel uh, acknowledged and that you're cared about. That, that's so important. And I really believe that having an open dialogue with your healthcare provider is the, the first step to that. So despite the fact that my specialty is medical negligence, I have a true respect uh, for healthcare providers. And I genuinely believe that 
the vast majority, if not 99.9% .9 of them truly want to do the best. You know, we don't know what's going on with their day or what patient they've just seen. So the context is often everything, right? And so uh, you need to come into it knowing that you do have to be their advocate with their healthcare team. That's the starting point. So going in with some knowledge. Now we all know that healthcare providers don't like Dr. Google. In fact, they very much dislike Dr. Google. But what I would say about that is this, and I personally also will go on the internet to give myself some base knowledge, but I also defer to my healthcare providers. And I think that that's the balance that you need to strike. So you need to educate yourself before going in so that you have a base knowledge and you can ask educated or the right kinds of questions about if you know ahead of time, there are various different things with the same symptoms that could be going on. Your healthcare provider says, I think it's this particular issue. You can say, um, can I just ask why you don't think it's why? And that's not, um, you know, being a difficult patient. It's just asking the question and you can always defer to them, but then you have the knowledge. Or if there's various different treatment options, why are we going with this and not that? And and maybe, maybe it's something they haven't considered, but maybe there are things about your particular child that results in the healthcare provider choosing a different option. Maybe there's new research out that says a particular treatment modality is going to be better than something that's older and has much more, uh, is published more on the internet, right? So all of these things factor in, and it doesn't mean you need to question your healthcare provider's expertise, but it puts you in a position to be able to ask the right questions. And I fully feel that that is incredibly important, knowing the questions to ask. And so doing that research yourself, um, getting that knowledge is so important because then you know the questions to ask. It's just important. I also really value when my healthcare provider says to me, I'm not sure. Let me look into that. That is absolutely not a sign that they don't know what they're doing. It's the best sign that shows that they're willing to think about things and be a partner with you in your child's care. And so I value that incredibly. Um, so I don't know if they're, you know, we, I think have a few healthcare providers in our audience or on our panel. And, and I can say with complete confidence that for me, being a lawyer who has sued healthcare providers and being a patient as well, I value that so much because I know then that when they're telling me something with authority and with assurance, they fully believe in that and then I can accept that. So that's all really important. Also keeping your own organization, record keeping system. I know this, this is a pain, I, I really do. But if you can have records for yourself, if you can keep things so that you can say to a new healthcare provider, oh, actually that test was done last year, here's the result or you know whatever it might be to have all of that yourself and have it whether it's a journal whether it's a binder whatever it is that works for you but to have some sense of what's gone on it can also be record keeping in terms of what's going on in your kid's life that's brought you to the specialist so you know um if if your child's dealing with spasticity and it's increasing and certain triggers are happening and you're keeping some kind of record of what's triggering that, that's so helpful to a healthcare provider and puts you in such a great position for them also to rely upon you, to not go around you, to not think, you know, this parent doesn't know what they're doing, to really value your input because you are the absolute expert on your child and you're proving it. So all of those things I think put you in a really good position to be able to navigate the healthcare system in the best way that you can add to it. But the other side is that we're reliant upon these professionals. At the end of the day, we have to rely upon these people to provide services to us, to give us answers, to order the tests, all of the things. And so knowing your rights within the medical system is also important. So I've got the list here, high level, of course, but knowing your rights, I think is, is so key. So information, you do have a right to information. You have a right to ask questions. You absolutely have the right to know about treatment options, risks of procedures, um, all of these things you get to know that you are not being difficult to ask these questions. And in fact, it's incumbent upon your treatment providers to tell you what the risks are to your child. 
Um, it's a little bit different. So one of the rights an adult has that is not quite the same with a child. So an adult can refuse any treatment they want at any time. It's not quite as simple when we're dealing with a child because if you and the healthcare provider completely butt heads over something that they see as an essential treatment, it is a little more complicated because they need to do what's best for the child. So you've got to keep in mind that it's not um, as clear with a child at, for a parent to be able to say, I refuse that treatment. For you as an adult, as an individual, absolutely you can, but it's not so easy. And so I have heard situations where doctors have said they're gonna get the CIS involved, or they're gonna take things to another to another avenue in order to get you know, these things um, figured out. I would really encourage you to seek legal assistance if that's what's happening, if you truly feel that there's there's a situation like that on your hands because you know you certainly don't want to have to go down a road of CAS and you know asking this is where asking for a second opinion can be really valuable and if you've got a healthcare provider that truly wants to do what's best for your family and your child and the second opinion is going to be the same well then I would like to believe that they're going to do that they're not just going to find it uh, a difficult parent that they're dealing with so these are all things you need to negotiate carefully um, because it's not quite as black and white and if anyone believes that you know they're allowed to refuse treatment it's not so simple for kids um, you can have a support person there now of course covid big problem for that you know one of the big things um, i'm on the board of the um, canadian premature babies uh, foundation and this has been a, a one of our issues this year is caregivers in the nicu and only having one parent and how hard that's been for everyone. So I appreciate in saying this in terms of my rights, this past year and a half has been a lot different. It's been a very different picture. So setting that aside for a minute, um, you know, moving forward, when we're back in a normal world, you can absolutely bring someone. Now, ways around this right now, have your phone, call someone, Put it on FaceTime. Bring someone in virtually if you're the only person allowed to attend that appointment. Um, whether it is a family member, a friend, somebody who's got some experience in in the area of medicine or what, what have you, someone just maybe that will hear things a li little differently than you do as a parent who's feeling quite emotional and vulnerable, something's going on with your child. So think about that as an option. Records access. So I've absolutely heard hear parents tell me that they don't have access to things or that they've been told they can get that after your child is discharged. This is something where you can absolutely assert your right. And I think Brenda will make a comment about this in a minute. But you do have rights to see those records. You know, they might think you'll have no idea what you're looking at. And that may be to some degree true. Medical records can be very difficult to make heads or tails of. Yeah. But it, when it comes to reports from specialists, when it comes to discharge summaries, when it comes to tests, you have a right to see it. And you can insist upon seeing those things. You are fully within your rights to do that. And so often my parents, when I've reviewed a record or a specialist summary with them, they'll say, I had no idea. And this was right in a record right in the file saying like for example the stroke example saying that this was a stroke and they didn't know so you can ask to read those reports um, and lastly you have the option of making a complaint uh, if you're truly unsatisfied after your care has been completed if you're in hospital something's going on certainly you can go to your patient advocate and the administration of the hospital you absolutely you can do that but if it's an after issue you have a number of options. The CPSO or the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario is where complaints can be made about physicians. The CNO um, is the College of Nurses of Ontario also has the option of a complaint process. And then there's the Ombudsman of Ontario. And the Ombudsman can hear complaints that are more administration based. So the Ombudsman deals with long-term care homes, hospitals. Um, they have a whole oversight function, which is more when you're dealing with issues that are systemic in nature. So um, anyone who needs a little more information about any of those, I know I rattled all of that off quite quickly. Please email me. More than happy to hear from anyone who wants a little guidance on that. It's not going to cost anything. Just send me an email. Happy to provide you resources on any of those things. And just to um, to jump in, um, I'm just going to move this ahead. Um, so just to jump in quickly too, to add one thing to what Janet said there as well is, um, you know, almost every hospital do does have um, a patient advocate or a patient 
um, services or a patient ombudsman within the hospital. Um, and so that's, I mean, I know there's sometimes a reluctancy because you're like, well, how impartial can they be if they're in the hospital? Um, but they actually can be a great source of resource to help you navigate a complaint or to help you sort of put things in perspective or to think about next steps. I've had to do that myself. Um, so keep that in mind as well. If, you know, the idea of going to a professional college or, you know, jumping right to the provincial ombudsman might feel like a lot, uh, remember, and, and not all of the um, challenges that you may encounter um, are of the nature where you need to file that type of complaint. They could be the way you've been spoken to. They could be, um, you know, I, I don't want to minimize anything, but they could be something that's a little bit more minor um, that needs to be addressed and should be addressed. And you don't want to have happen again, um, but it's something that, you know, I think the hospital wants to know um, because they don't want to have this turn into something bigger later. And, um, you know, they want to be able to, to, to resolve those things. So just think about the local patient ombudsman or the patient re, uh, relations person within your hospital. Um, and so, you know, as I was listening to Jan, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, those are all such great points. And, um, you know, I wish in, <laughs> I wish that that was always real life. Um, and, and it is, it can be right. Mm -hmm. They're so important. And all of those pieces about what you need to have with you to be, um, you know, more prepared to be an advocate are so, uh, so true. And, you know, all of our rights are a hundred percent as they are, they're laid out there. The challenge is, you know, what happens when, you um, when you can't get someone to listen to what your right is, or you actually can't make that happen. And, you know, I'm sure, um, you know, there's probably some parents that were listening, like, you know, it's not that easy. And we know it's not that easy. Trust <laughs> us, Jan, I know it's not that easy. Um, but I still think it's important not to dismiss that sometimes the process can be a little easier than you anticipated, or it doesn't always have to be so adversarial. Um, so, you know, I wanted to just go through a few things really quickly from a real lens from someone who's lived this, still lives this. My son is 14. We're consistently having to, to advocate. I hate using that word so much, but that's the best word um, to advocate for him in a number of different environments and situations. Um, and the one thing I want to tell people going right in um, that I know now is you're not going to win every challenge. You're not, you're just not going to win everything. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate, but that's just the way that it is. It's the way the system works, it's the way life works. It's not always, you know, going to work out the way that we want. And that's very unfortunate. Um, and, you know, we hope that if we can't necessarily fix that, that we could hopefully evoke some change or start a conversation. I think that's the way, um, you know, that I approach things um, now with, you know, what I know now is uh, that, um, just because you didn't get the resolution you were hoping for doesn't mean that it's not going to change eventually and doesn't mean that your issue is not important and it doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be changed. Um, I also, you know, think it's important to know that not all healthcare providers are equal and that's good or bad. Um, you know, for a number of years, I would go into a meeting right away with chip on my shoulder, ready to fight. And I had never met the doctor before um, because of my previous experience. And that's not a great way to start off a relationship. It's not a great way um, to, to begin uh, anything like that. And so I've realized that, you know, just because my experiences in the past have been negative doesn't mean they'll be negative moving forward. But having said that, um, you know, you know, Sometimes you have great experiences and then moving forward, you don't. So not all healthcare providers are equal on either end. So you need to really just uh, assess that relationship as it comes to you. And here's the other thing too, is the system is not here to support families. And we've heard that repeatedly. We've heard it more through COVID. Um, there's other challenges that are going on with families, like Jan said, with access to bedside or you know, caregiver supports, it's just not. Um, we're hoping it changes. We're seeing more family integrated care. We're seeing more references to patients and families as partners. I don't know if we're truly going to ever get there, um, but that is one thing I know now. This system is just not set up to support families in the way that we need, and it's not there to help families. It's really not. It's not how it was designed. Um, and so you, you know, we're slowly, like I said, seeing that evolution. But you have to recognize when you get there, their first priority is not to make sure that you know, you have what you need and you're supported and you have everything to move forward. And I think once you get that in your head, you're better um, prepared to know, I'm going to have to probably navigate this a little differently and, and have the mindset that it's not going to necessarily be easy. What I would do differently um, is, and this is so much easier said than done, is, and this is for any type of advocacy, is try not to let your emotions prevail. 
Um, we've all heard the 24 hour rule. My husband is a hockey coach, he tells parents all the time, wait 24 hours before you email me because you're emotional. We are emotional. Uh, I've been bedside with my son. This is very difficult. I'm tired. I'm worried. Um, I've got people coming into the room telling me all this information I can't process. And so you're emotional and you can't make good decisions when you're emotional. So what I do do though, is that I find I come up with the best um, arguments and things when I'm emotional. So I will make notes for myself. So I don't lose that fiery, if you will, but I try not to have a conversation or act on something when I am that emotional. And with that, it's also take your time, take your time. I know you're angry. Something's happened, but if you can take time to make a plan, so back to those things that Jan talked about, if you can take the time to find out a little bit more resources, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if, if you can, if you can find your champions, if you can make, you know, information, if you can, if you can gather information, if you can do your research, you'll just be in such a better position when you actually step forward to have that conversation, to make that complaint, to have that investigation done, uh, whatever that might be. So take your time and make a plan and bring someone with you. Um, this took me a long time to realize. I thought, I got this, this is fine. I, I handle most of the medical appointments in our house. I got this until I didn't have it until I was in a meeting where news is coming to me and all I can see are black spots in front of my eyes. And all I can hear is ringing in my ears because I'm obviously in a bit of a state of shock. And so I always tell people, bring someone. Um, and if you can't bring someone with you, record the meeting, but tell them I'm going to record the meeting because um, you may forget, or you may not hear what's being said, and you might need that for later on. So you're not recording it so that you can come back and say, you said this, you're recording it for your own information so that you can listen back and be able to process it. Um, if you're having difficulty doing that at the time. So those are the things that I would do differently. What I would do exactly the same, and I will never change this is trust your gut, trust your gut. It's there for a reason. There's, there, there is evidence and research, um, that does make connections between the gut and the brain that tell you that there's a reason why you have those feelings, trust your gut. Um, and you know, don't be okay being treated as less than. You are, I'm so tired when I hear mom says, mom reports, the mother said, the father said, the parents said, no, don't be treated less than. Just because you don't have a medical degree doesn't mean that you don't know your child very well, doesn't mean that you are not as smart. Um, it just means that that person's gone to school to specialize in something you know, specifically that you haven't. Um, but we come with a wealth of knowledge. We come with uh, from a pure place um, and we come with the right intentions. And so don't um, be less than. Uh, use all avenues that are available to you. Find your champions to help you. Um, there's nothing like, you know, you're tired. And, um, you know, again, we know this. And I say this to people all the time. If you have a great team behind you, even if it's your neighbor, because you want to get, you know, an accessible swing in your park, but you've done everything you can. I bet you, you go to your neighbor and say, I need this swing for my son. They're going to be all over contacting somebody. So find your friends, find your champions, find the champion within the healthcare system that can help you. you usually we'll find that. Um, so look for that person, prioritize. I've already said, you know, uh, about taking your time. Also do not be worried to dismiss, um, you know, a team, a member, um, if it's an adversarial relationship, if you're not getting the answers that you need, if this is not helpful, if this is causing you stress, if this is causing you anxiety, and you truly don't think your, your child is getting the best um, care. And, and that's a real thing. Change that team member, ask for a second opinion, ask for a referral, go somewhere else. You're well within your rights to do that. And don't let a hospital tell you that you can't do that. Yes, you can. You can go from one place to another if that is more comfortable for you. And they should also be happy to have you go if you're not happy with that relationship. And that leads me to be okay being that parent. I used to be really upset when it was like that parent. Oh, here comes that parent. I wear it as a badge of honor now. Yeah, I am that parent. I'm that parent who is going to call it out if it needs to be called out, who's gonna make change if it needs to make change. I'm always gonna do right by my children. I'm always gonna be right, you know, do right by that. Um, and wear it as a badge of honor. And if you are that parent, it means that you have the ability and the energy and, and the um, confidence to speak up, to challenge something that is difficult to challenge. Um, and so, so don't ever be afraid to be that. I would do that exactly the same today as I've done in the past. All right. Okay, Jan, sorry, over to you again. No, that's great. 
Um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on education advocacy because there's another presentation today all about this, and we certainly don't want to steal that thunder. Um, but just a few comments. So a number of years ago, I volunteered um, with Pro Bono Ontario's Education Advocacy Group. So I'm not sure if everyone's aware of this or not, um, but I certainly, even as a lawyer, was not aware of this. Um, it's lawyers who volunteer their time to represent families dealing with various different educational issues. So it could be access. It could be, um, you know, in some cases, like if a parent feels there is an unjust suspension or something of that nature, it can be those kinds of things. It can be safety issues in a school. Uh, if a school, for example, changes uh, your child's IEP without notice to you, um, that's not okay. They can't just do that unilaterally. There needs to be a team discussion about that. And if things like that happen that you fully feel that are unsupported, your healthcare providers are also telling you, no, 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 your child really needs this heightened level of support, for example. Um, there's this program through Pro Bono Ontario. You can get a lawyer free of charge with expertise navigating the educational system. So I encourage you to go on there and check if it's something you need help with because it can be everything, you know, the, the cases I handled we're right at the early stages, the meetings between the school and um, the parents and managing exactly what was happening throughout the different stages. So go on there. It gives you lots of information. There's a whole frequently asked questions section about what um, types of concerns, but I, I definitely believe the things that most of you are going to have concerns about around probably IEPs or safety issues all are covered by it. Um, it's not just parents that are unemployed. I mean, certainly there is absolutely a financial need-based component, but um, they classify it as everyone um, middle class and below essentially that should have access to the program. So it's something that's available to you and I would encourage you to utilize it because if you're in that situation, the last thing you need is a whole nother battle on your hands. Um, it's exhausting. And so having another team member to help you with that, nothing but good. Absolutely. And as Jen said, we do have another presentation in our lineup today that is going to speak specifically to education advocacy, but we thought we would be remiss in not including this. Um, and one part before I, I wrap up is, you know, remember too that, um, you know, if you don't want to go this far and you don't think you need a lawyer, you still have avenues available to you. Find out what the, um, you know, what the um, escalation procedures are within your school system. Um, find out what the chain of command is, where you will bring the concerns or complaints. Remember, there's always a superintendent or a director of education you can contact. And you can also reach out to your local trustees who have been elected. Um, I, I wear that hat in another one of my uh, in, in another life. Uh, so I do wear that hat. And you can also reach out, like I said, to your trustees or your local MPPs, your MPs. Um, they're there, they're your elected officials, and they can often sometimes provide some assistance for you in navigating some of these uh, complaints or concerns you may have with respect to the education system. Um, and so that is it for us today. We could talk for hours. You could tell we had so much to say. We condensed into this uh, because we have such a great lineup of speakers uh, for our, our event today. Um, but you can always reach out. Our we'll make sure our information is available. As Jan said, reach out. We have guides. Uh, we have information. We're always happy to have a conversation. Um, it doesn't always have to be about, you know, the case. Um, we're happy to talk anytime if we can help. So thanks so much, Jan, for hanging with me today um, and talking about it. We're both very passionate about advocacy um, and we hope we've been able to give you a few nuggets of wisdom today that you can take with you. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks everyone. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Zeldin. I got to know Jeffrey a number of years ago as our um, kids both have cerebral palsy and uh, he's a couple of years ahead of me in the journey, um, but I've gotten to know quite a bit um, about um, raising a child with a disability um, and getting to um, learn a little bit more firsthand from he and his wife, Michelle, um, as they have um, raised three kids, including their daughter, Paige. 
And so Jeff um, is here to speak with us today. He is the president of Special Needs Financial um, and is a financial consultant with over 16 years of experience. While he has knowledge of many facets of financial planning, he has chosen to specialize in financial and estate planning for individuals with special needs and their families. As I mentioned, being the father of a 17-year-old daughter who happens to have cerebral palsy has given him a unique perspective into the difficulties that families face when trying to navigate all of the financial responsibilities that come along with having a family member with special needs. Jeff's approach to financial planning is to not only provide the products available, such as RDSPs, RRSPs, life insurance, and TFSAs, but to develop a comprehensive financial and estate plan tailored to the client's unique situation. He helps clients wade through the disability tax credit forms, ODSP, SSAH, uh, CCAC slash LIN, um, and these additional services and knowledge is what separates Jeffrey from most other advisors and more specifically the banks that rarely understand RDSPs, let alone the greater financial planning requirements from a special needs perspective. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Zaldin. I'm the father of a 17-year-old daughter with cerebral palsy and an independent designated professional advisor who specializes in financial and estate planning for individuals with special needs. In addition to being expert on RDSPs, I also help clients protect ODSP and other government assistance. I can sell registered uh, retirement investment products, tax-free savings accounts, registered education savings plan, segregated funds, and life insurance. I understand how difficult it is sometimes in keeping up with all the medical and therapy appointments, so I help my clients sort through their personal situation, determine what the ideal financial plan would be, and then work with clients to determine where and in what order they should be using the funds available to them in order to maximize their finances and minimize tax implications and government clawbacks. I am here to speak about the disability tax credit, provide some basic information about special needs financial and estate planning, provide information about how the RDSP works, explain what Henson Trusts are and what they can be used for, and how to protect the ability to receive ODSP and future government assistance through proper financial planning. I look forward to making myself available during the question and answer portion of the day. If for some reason you are not able to ask your question, I offer free no obligation consultations, so please do not hesitate to contact me if you have a question or need any help. Many benefits for individuals with special needs are provided based upon the person having applied and being approved for the disability tax credit, otherwise known as the DTC. The DTC is a federal tax credit applied against your income at any level. To qualify for the DTC, you need to complete CRA Form T2201 with the assistance of a qualified medical practitioner and submit to the CRA for approval. When you submit the application, make sure that you check the box on the DTC form asking the CRA to review all previous tax returns. Please note that although you only receive tax benefit for the DTC if you have enough income to be able to utilize the credit, you should always apply as there are other benefits such as the RDSP, Registered Disability Savings Plan, that require DTC approval. Also, the DTC can be transferred tax year to tax year to a supporting parent that can be benefit from it if the individual or the other parent that the DTC is currently attached to can no longer use any part of the credit. If your family qualifies for the children's disability benefit, then you will also need to request that the CRA goes back and reprocesses the CDB for the previous years as they only automatically go back two years otherwise. It is imperative to make sure that when you fill out the DTC form that it has the correct date of disability. In most cases, the date of disability is several years prior to the date of diagnosis, and that could make a significant difference in how much you are entitled to receive in benefits and refunds. I have noticed that in a lot of cases, it's the date of diagnosis that a doctor or an individual uh, innocently puts in and mistakenly does so and costs themselves a lot of money and a lot of potential benefit. The Canadian government has also recently announced that they will be adjusting the DTC process to make it easier for disabled indiv individuals without physical issues to qualify. Whether or not that makes a difference to the difficulty that they've had in, uh, uh, in accepting, being accepted for the DTC will still remain to be seen. So for special needs financial planning, it's important to ensure that you are covering the basics. You should review your life and health insurance coverages, review your will, powers of attorney. You should also consider when to open an RDSP and how best to fund the contributions in order to maximize the grant money that you're eligible for. 
You should also be looking at your finances now and determine if your previous financial plan, if you had one, is still appropriate for the current situation, both now and for after when you are gone. This may include setting up a Henson Trust or another type of trust. We will discuss Henson Trust later. To ensure you are planning properly, it is extremely important to have a team of experts that understand how to best plan for individuals with special needs. Also, there are substantial changes to benefits and programs when the individual turns 18, and planning should begin shortly after their 17th birthday. There is also the question of whether or not your child will be able to sign a power of attorney or if a guardianship is something that should be considered. Once approved for the DTC, you are potentially able to qualify for an RDSP. The RDSP is a federal government program that allows you to contribute money into a plan and subsequently will receive grants of up to $70,000 lifetime and bonds of up to $20,000 lifetime from the government, which can then grow tax-free for future requirements of a person with special needs. To receive RDSP grants, there must be contributions into the RDSP and the amount of, uh, and the amount of grant entitlement will depend on net family income. To receive RDSP bonds, however, there is no contribution necessary, although there is an income threshold that we will discuss later. To qualify for an RDSP, the beneficiary must have been approved for the DTC, be a Canadian resident with a valid SIN number, and the account must be opened before the end of the year the individual turns 59. However, grants and bonds are only granted for individuals until the end of the year the individual turns 49. The RDSP is meant as a long-term investment generally not to be accessed until the individual is at least 39, but most likely 49 plus. That is because many, money withdrawn from an RDSP will require any government grants or bonds received within the prior 10 years to re be repaid to the tune of $3 repayment for each dollar withdrawn up to the total amount received in the previous 10 years. If the financial advisor you are working with does not take the time to explain properly the rules around the grants of bonds and the rule about how to withdraw funds from the RDSP, I suggest you find someone else to help you open an RDSP and do your financial and estate planning. Just by opening an RDSP, you become eligible for the government bond money, and if you make a contribution, the government grant money. There is an ability to do a tax-deferred rollover of registered funds of a parent or grandparent, but these are subject to rules which I will talk about later. There is a maximum lifetime contribution into an RDSP of $200,000, and the contribution limit does not include the grant, bond money, or increase investments. Contributions are non-tax deductible, but the plan does go tax-free until the money is withdrawn from the RDSP. The net family income that I'm referring to below is the parent's net income reported on line 236 of your tax return if the child is under 18. The year your, the year your child turns 19, net family income becomes the individual's net income them and any spouse they may have. The CRA uses the two years previous tax return for this calculation. For example, for 2021, they would use your 2019 tax return. Therefore, you should file a nil tax return for your child when they are 17 so that they can maximize the benefit when it goes on their net family income at age 19. I want to differentiate between bond and grant money. Bond money is granted based upon net family income and does not require any contributions. For 2021, if your net family income is under $32,028, you are eligible for $1,000 of bond money. If the net income is between $32,028 and $49,020, you will be eligible for bond money based upon a formula somewhere between zero and 1,000. For most of you, that means that bond money won't be available until the year your child is turning 19. Grant money is based upon contributions made into an RDSP. For 2021, if your net family income is over $98,040, then if you contribute $1,000, you will receive $1,000 of grant money. If your net family income is below $98,040, then if you contribute $1,500, you will receive $30,500 of grant money. This slide shows an example of how someone entitled to the maximum amount of grant money can catch up for the previous 10 years and how in four years with contributions of 25,000, you could receive government grant money of 50,500 and government bond money of 15,000. The slide also shows how complex the calculations can be to figure out the RDSP grant and bond entitlement. For an annual contribution of $1,500, you could receive $3,500 of grant money. 
This is done by the first $500 receiving triple grant and the next $1,000 receiving double grant money. The government will use the highest grant first. For 2021, if you contribute $3,500, you can receive grants of the annual maximum amount of $10,500. As you can see, the 500 that triples first. In 2022, you if you contribute $4,000, you could receive the maximum annual grant money of 10,500, which is 2,500 tripled and $1,500 doubled. In, 25, in 2023 and 2024, if you contribute $5,000, you would receive the maximum annual amount of 10,500. In 2025, if you contribute $4,000, you would receive grant money of $8,500, which is the $500 tripled and the $3,500 doubled. After you are all caught up in 2025 going forward with an annual contribution of the 1500 you will receive the $3,500 of grant money until the year 2031. In 2031, you will be able to fully uh, utilize the remaining amount of grant entitlement with a contribution of $750. This means that, you're, uh, that for a contribution of $29,750, you would have received from the government, the $70,000 maximum lifetime grant money that you would be entitled to. In addition to all this grant money, dependent on the net family income, you could also potentially have received bond money. The total lifetime bond available is $20,000. And this too is subject to the catch up for the previous 10 years. By 2022, you could have as much as $15,000 of bond money and you could have reached the maximum bond entitlement of $20,000 by 2027. Please note that if you go back to the earlier 10 years prior to the date of disability, this should not be confused with the date of diagnosis, which as discussed earlier could be years later. It is important to know that there are specific rules when withdrawing from an RDSP. This is often not mentioned when you open an RDSP unless you are working with someone extremely knowledgeable. As I mentioned earlier, all government monies, both grant and bonds, received in an RDSP have a 10-year hold, and any payments made if grants or bonds were received in the 10 years prior to the payment will force a repayment. You do not get to remove contributions and grants that were received longer than 10 years ago without repaying the government if you have received any government grants or bonds within the previous 10 years. The amount of money that would be subject to repayment is called the assistance holdback amount. The repayment is $3 for each dollar that is withdrawn, up to a maximum of the total of all grants and bonds received in the last 10 years. It is important to note that if a beneficiary no longer qualifies for the DTC, then the RDSP no longer needs to be collapsed, though the RDSP will need to be held until the disabled individual turns 60 and there can be no further contributions into the RDSP. If an RDSP has more government contributions than private contributions, which makes the RDSP at PGAP, then when taking out funds, you will only be able to take a maximum amount of the greater value determined by a CRA formula or 10% of the account, whichever is greater. A one-time withdrawal of funds is called a disability assistance payment, a DAP, and an ongoing payment is called a lifetime disability assistance payment, which is an LDAP. And this must be started no later than the end of the year the individual turns 60, the LDAP. I have been asked many times if someone has a DTC that is approved for only five or 10 years, should they bother opening an RDSP? The answer is typically yes, but will depend on your individual circumstance, and I would be happy to discuss that with you privately if that applies. There are other ways to contribute into an RDSP as well, such as a rollover of registered money from a deceased parent or grandparent, but the beneficiary must be a financial dependent, and this would have to be verified by them having previously claimed the individual as a dependent on their income tax return. Receiving an inheritance, if the individual is eligible for ODSP, then it is very important to structure the inheritance properly in the will, and a rollover of the RESP, the Registered Education Savings Plan. This would be the gain or interest not only, not the principal, and is not considered as an RDSP contribution for purposes of grant money. Also, anyone contributing to an RDSP if they have the authorization of the account holder. An RDSP can help cover living expenses later in life, and it works and pairs very well with the Henson Trust, which has protection from the asset threshold of ODSP, but not the income threshold. 
One of the most important features of an RDSP beyond the bond, grants of bonds is the payments from an RDSP do not affect most other income-tested provincial and government federal pro, uh, programs such as ODSP, old age security, guaranteed income supplement, CPP, GST benefits, or social assistance benefits. Speaking of ODSP, some individuals with special needs will be eligible for this when they turn 18 years old. ODSP is a program managed by the Ontario Ministry of, Consum of Community and Social Services that provides income support to help paying living expenses such as food and housing. It can also provide help to people with disabilities who can and want to prepare to find a job. There are also potentially significant drug and dental coverage benefits for someone who qualifies. Unfortunately, along with ODSP comes very strict rules for both income and asset thresholds and the amount of gifts that one can re uh, receive. As of September 2017, there were new rules that came in that year, up to $10,000 of all gifts in a 12-month period, which is a 12-month rolling period, not calendar year, are exempt from being considered as income unless used to pay, help pay for a disability-related item or service that have been approved in advance by your ODSP worker. If you earn more than $200 a month in income, 50% of your net earnings or business profits if you're self-employed over that $200 are deducted from your income support payment. It is noteworthy that if you're attending a secondary or post-secondary school full-time, ODSP will not deduct any of your earnings from your ODSP income support. There are also asset threshold limits for individuals who receive ODSP. For a single person, the limit was raised to $40,000 as of January 1st, 2018. There are some exempt assets that you can own above that amount, but otherwise you will lose eligibility for breaching the limit threshold. If you are concerned about this or want to learn more, please contact me. A very effective way to protect assets from an individual who is on ODSP is to utilize a Henson Trust. A Henson Trust is an absolute discretionary trust where the beneficiaries of the trust have an interest in the trust property, but the trustee is the legal owner and therefore the trust is not considered an asset of the disabled individual. The Henson Trust, like an insurance trust, must be set up in a will prior to death and cannot be done by the executor after a person's death. All monies in a Henson Trust will not affect provincial benefits. However, any money withdrawn from a Henson Trust is subject to asset and income thresholds under ODSP rules unless used for authorized disability equipment or services. That can include PT, OT, nursing, PSW, and other services as affected by ODSP. If you withdraw funds for a Henson Trust that are used for medical-related services, then that will be subject to the $10,000 of gifting um, in that 12-month period of time. Assets from a parent's estate are the most common source of funding for a Henson Trust. That includes registered assets over the maximum contribution amount allowed into an RDSP. Life insurance is also an extremely common funding source. Anyone can leave their assets in a Henson Trust for a qualifying individual, and this includes grandparents, siblings, and other relatives and friends. Just remember that if leaving funds to someone on ODSP, it is imperative to plan properly to protect them from losing ODSP eligibility. For example, life insurance has to be willed to the Henson Trust or to the person or for the benefit of the Henson Trust and not to the individual themselves. It is so important to ensure that you have a team of knowledgeable experts to assist you. There are very complex decisions that must be made, ones that you may not have even contemplated, and beyond the scope of many financial advisors, and generally beyond the, uh, way beyond the person that works at the local branch of your bank. There are more concepts such as the Qualified Disability Trust that will need to be discussed as well. You should find a financial advisor, lawyer, and accountant who can work together to ensure that you have planned for everything that you should be planning for. They can help you work through the various issues and develop the right kind of individual plan for you and your family. At Special Needs Financial, our goal is to make, to make planning for the future of an individual with special needs and your entire family an easier process. Through the use of government programs such as an RDSP, other savings vehicles, and life insurance, as well as putting you in touch with those individuals who specialize in other areas required for a full plan, we hope to make your financial goals a reality. I hope that you found the information useful. I know that some of this can be overwhelming and complex. I'm trying to hit the important notes while still giving you the information that you know in order to know what right questions to ask. I look forward to answering any questions you have later. 
Thank you and have a great day.
Um, our next speaker is Nancy Lajoy, and Nancy and I got to know each other oh, a couple of years ago now. Um, uh, Nancy was with uh, OBIA, which is the Ontario Brain Injury Association, and was working on a, a caregiver um, engagement project. And I had the benefit of connecting with her and working with her uh, alongside herself and um, some other collaborators um, on an amazing project and initiative. And thankfully, thankfully we have kept in touch. Um, and I was really um, excited that Nancy could come and present to all of you today. Nancy is a longtime educator um, and a strong advocate for children living with disabilities. She has a master's of education in inclusive education um, and her over 30 years of educational experience includes working as a special education resource teacher and a special education consultant in the Peterborough area. Nancy's recent education and commitment um, has focused on supporting families and children living with acquired brain injury um, through her work as a caregiver education specialist for the Ontario Brain Injury Association and an educational consultant for Trillium Inclusive Education Services. Nancy is dedicated to supporting parents and influencing educators, so each child receives an education that meets their needs, enhances their sense of belonging and self-worth, and develops their life potential. So welcome to Nancy. Hi, thanks so much for the time to listen to me today, um, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. So as a parent of a child with uh, some specific needs, you most likely have been invited to attend a school meeting or you will at some day attend a school meeting with the special education department at your child's schools. And sometimes these meetings can be really overwhelming and, and anxiety producing and mysterious, but, but really any school meeting is a great opportunity for a parent to um, advocate for all of their child's needs. And today what I'm gonna do is just uh, take some time to share a few tips and information on exactly how you can um, use the meetings to speak out on behalf of your child. And I present this information as a retired special education teacher. And in hindsight, there are a number of things that I wish that I had done a little more of to um, address just the communication within, within teams and support parents in their ability to advocate. And at this point now, I'm um, as, a, as a bit of a um, consultant um, working with some parents and adults with disabilities, um, there are a number of things that um, I recognize now that we, we should be putting in place at the school level that we're not. So I'm just going to share with you some of those um, trip tips and information today. So why is it, is it important to advocate at school meetings? Well, first and foremost, you are your child's voice and you are your child's representative. And any time you can have with the school team to talk about your child is, is definitely worthwhile. Um, as you probably know, there are a lot of kids with a number of unique needs within the school. So um, your child is not the only one. And unfortunately, there are a limited amount of resources within the school. So it's important that you advocate so that your child does get the fair share of those resources. In a school, there's always constantly changing priorities. And sometimes at the school level, it appears as though it's almost reactionary. So if, there, if um, some children are having some difficulties, then all of the resources go, go to that area. And, and that's important to have that flexibility. But again, if you continue to advocate for your child regularly, um, the school will positively respond then. So as with everything else, there is a limited amount of funding, limited amount of resources, and those resources need to be spread around. And again, as a parent advocating for your, their child and making sure that the school is aware of your child's needs, there's a greater likelihood that they'll be able to meet those needs. And there's always also changing funding, changing funding with government, um, changing funding within school boards. Uh, so again, it's important to advocate. So what we say is don't wait, always advocate. Don't wait until there's a problem at the school and then you're, you're faced with trying to um, paddle backwards a little bit to have the school um, aware of your child's need. So just continue to advocate going forward. 
So the tips I'm going to share with you today um, are, are brief and just highlights. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is just having a positive mindset towards these meetings. Um, be well prepared for each meeting. Be sure to keep your child the focus of any meeting. Discuss social health and wellness at school meetings. And then um, do your best to document all of the meetings that you attend. So of course, um, we hear a lot about positive thinking and uh, positive mindset, and, and there's definitely a lot of power in positivity. And if there's a positive mindset, it often leads to positive outcomes. And certainly that's what we want to have for your child at school. So a couple of things that I recommend to ensure that there is a positive mindset. First one is trust the team. So the school team is full of well-educated educators and they are there supporting the best interest of your child. Um, so do your best to trust them. Um, you are an essential member of that team and it's important that you work towards building the relationships around your child. Also trust the process. The, the education and human rights legislations out there have um, been provided to guide a number of these procedures and therefore you can you can actually feel somewhat comforted and protected knowing that these legislations are out there so being prepared for each meeting um, a really important part of advocacy is in the preparation so it's important that when you attend each meeting, you go into the meeting uh, feeling prepared and confident that, that you're able to represent your child well. The first thing to do is to understand the purpose of the meeting. There are different purposes for different meetings that do happen at the school, and, and sometimes it can become some, somewhat confusing. But, um, you know, you can go ahead and, and call the principal, talk to the special education teacher, talk to your child's teacher teacher to find out exactly what is going to be discussed at the meeting you're being invited to. The other thing that would be important in advance is to understand exactly what your role is as, as a parent. Um, what is your contributing role? What will you be expected to bring, if anything? What will you be expected to do following the, the meeting? So just have a good idea of what your role is. Um, being familiar with the related legislation can be really overwhelming at times, but uh, it, it's really important to have a bit of an understanding about the legislation that's applicable to your child so that you are aware of what the school must do for your child and what the procedures are. Um, and, and that'll help just with your confidence and in going into to these meetings. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the legislation um, coming up. Prior to going into the meetings, it would definitely be important to review any of the documents that will be discussed. So if it's a report card that's going to be discussed, if it's an individual education plan, um, be as familiar with those documents as possible, go through them, highlight them, any areas that you have questions, uh, just be prepared. Of, of course, sometimes you may be attending a meeting where they are the schools are presenting information, um, but and you can always ask for, for documents in advance, but um, yeah, it's important to know what's in your child's documents. Every school board has a guide to special education for parents and guardians. It would be really helpful if you could get a copy of that or they're always available on the school board's website. And there's often other special education documents there as well, special education board plan, um, any strategic planning always includes special education as well. So if you really wanna dive deep into what your school board is offering, there's possibilities to do that. So all of those things that happen before the meeting will really set you off well to advocate for your child. So I mentioned that I'm just going to very briefly highlight some of the legislation that is applicable to, to children at school. 
the first one, and it's it's a fairly new one, is, is actually a policy that was published by the Ontario Human Rights Commission in March of 2018, and it's called the Policy on Accessible Education for Students with Disabilities. And what this, this trumps, this policy would ap actually trump um, any of the Education Act uh, policies. And it, it generally just talks about the idea that any child with any type of, of disability um, must be accommodated. And one of the things that's also mentioned in, in this legislation or policy is the idea that sometimes other legislations can actually put a barrier up to a child receiving assistance. And it's important that school boards examine that and be sure that those barriers aren't being presented to individual children. The Education Act has published a document that's called P Special Education in Ontario Schools K-12. Um, this is where the school boards look to get the definitions on, on exceptionalities that children can be identified from with and then talks about just general programming that schools must comply with. Regulation 181.98 is referred to as the identification and placement of exceptional pupils. And this is a part of the Education Act. And this is the most, I would say, probably the most legislated um, process that you may be experiencing at the school at some point. It's the formal process to identify a child, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that. And then um, the school boards and the, or, or the um, Ministry of Education also presents a number of policy and program memoranda. So these are attached to the Education Act. And just one example would be um, PPM 156, which is supporting transitions for students with special education needs. And this uh, policy and program memoranda just talks about exactly how transition plans are to be de developed um, specifically for, for children that are living with autism and just works through the process of exactly how the transition planning is to occur. So just a few particulars then about the Identification Placement Review Committee meeting or the IPRC meeting. Um, again, that's Regulation 181.98 if you wanted to take a look and get more information on it. There's really three, three things that this committee will decide. The committee will decide whether or not your child is exceptional or not exceptional. So that's either a yes or a no. The committee will decide the area of exceptionality, and there are five areas that children can fall into. There's um, behavior, intellectual, communication, physical disability, and then multiple exceptionalities. And it's important to keep in mind that the exceptionalities are not a diagnosis. So some of the diagnoses that children may have may not fall within the category of exceptionalities. And a perfect example of that would be a child with an acquired brain injury. An acquired brain injury diagnosis does not fall within the area of exceptionality. However, the good news is if you can recall the um, human rights um, policy, it talks about disabilities specifically and an acquired brain injury is a disability. So therefore that would trump um, this act, this Ministry of Education Act. The third thing that this meeting will, will accomplish is determining the child's placement. So the ideal is that each child will be placed in the regular class, classroom and then the appropriate level of support decided, whether that be resource support within the classroom or withdrawal assistance. Um, but sometimes children need special education classrooms, so outside of the classroom, and that would be determined at the IPRC. 
So as far as the parent role goes, um, it would really be important for you to be present and participate. The, the first, every IPRC will start with um, a discussion around a student's or a child's strengths and needs. And that's certainly where the parent needs to come in and be sure that um, a good big picture of your child is being presented to the committee. Uh, it would, it's really important and you have the right to be present when the committee's decision is made. And then at the end of the meeting, when the decision is made, the parent will receive a statement of decision. Now, the only time you sign that would be if you are in agreement. If you are not in agreement, however, um, you have two possibilities. You can either request that another IPRC be convened, and you can also request an IPRC at other times. Um, you can also appeal the decision. So there's a, a process within the legislation that allows a parent to appeal, and then it goes to the appeal board. Um, most often, the not though, these uh, differences of opinion are figured out at the school level. Now, the parent does not have to agree with the decision in order for a school board to move forward with the identification. And um, what I found is, is just in what's good practice is if a parent is, is not interested in, in an identification, um, and, and a lot of parents and, and schools are, are removing some of the pressure connected with this legislation, then the child just wouldn't be identified. Um, however, if there's if the child needs to go into the place into a, a placement that's outside of the special ed or outside of the regular classroom, then it would then the, the schools have to actually um, go through the IPRC process. But most often than not, if, if the parent's not interested in an identification, the, the schools will, will work with that parent and just ensure that the, the programming for the child is appropriate. Oh, and here's Batman. He says, yes, I know this is an IP, IEP meeting. My wife told me to wear a suit. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes um, we're not sure exactly what, uh, what all of these meetings are all about. Um, and obviously Batman wasn't sure. So just to address the IEP meetings in general, again, the IEP is connected to regulation 18198. The general purpose is just to take a look at the IEP and review the IEP and discuss any updates. And uh, these meetings have to take place um, at the beginning of each, what would be considered a new IEP. And there's usually 30 days that's given to actually have a new IEP in your hands at the beginning of the school year. So around that time is when the IEP meetings would be scheduled. As a parent, you are a member of the IEP development team and right within the IEP, there is a, point, a place that outlines all of the team members and it's important that you're, you be represented as a part of that team. It's important that you provide all of the relevant information and any updated information that you could have if, if you are working with some outside agency. Uh, to support your child, it's important that you be sure that you communicate and provide the results of any of, of those assessments to the school so that they can, um, they can have a clear picture of your child's needs. And your role as well is to um, be sure to review the IEPs, any IEPs that come home, and then sign the IEPs saying that you have received them. A signature on the IEP does not mean that you are in agreement, however. Um, so some of the limitations that are related to IEPs is that uh, the IEP is very much an educational decision. So a parent agreement is not required for the school to implement what they feel is best. But again, um, you know, if there are differences of opinions, it, it is usually worked out at the school level. And parents may request an IEP review meeting at any time. If you believe that there are some things that need to be changed within your child's IEP, then for sure call a meeting at any time. 
So then there are a number of what I refer to as informal meetings that happen at the school. So uh, meetings around report card time, just general meetings, progress meetings that you could be called into to discuss. So generally these are just taking a look at and discussing your child's school performance and, and how well they're doing. Uh, these meetings could possibly address concerns, um, ad address safety concerns, and these meetings don't really have any particular legislation or procedures that are connected to them. So again, as, as a parent, you want to be sure that you are providing updated information, providing any feedback, and, and asking questions of how, regarding how your child is doing. Um, discuss ways that you can support your child. Uh, children do best when there's a strong partnership between the home and school and when, when parents can, can support the child at home in their education is when we see greatest successes happening. And it's also important for parents to follow up on any requests that the schools um, make so things like contacting outside agencies if if you're if you've been requested to seek some some counseling for your child or some additional therapies you know follow up with those requests uh, and support the school team and your child that way so as far as additional rights uh, as a, a parent you can call a meeting or a conference at at any time and you can also bring somebody with you. You can bring another advocate, you can bring a, you know, a friend who, who supports you and your child. Um, it's just a, really a good idea to inform the school of, of who that individual is and that you will be bringing them to the meeting. So it's really important that any school meeting, of course, focus on the child. Um, now, you know, when, when life gets busy and a number of uh, different types of people get into the room, some, sometimes conversations can, can stray. So it's, it's just a really good idea to be sure that your child is, is the focus. And one thing I re recommend, and, and I wish that I had encouraged parents to do this more often in my role as a special education teacher, is to, to encourage the parents to actually start each meeting with just a simple update of their child and, and how, how they're doing at home. And I'm going to share with you a, an idea about a one-page profile that can be provided at the beginning of meetings. Um, and there's an, you can find these and samples of these online as well. Uh, it is important to understand that there are different perspectives that are sitting around the table, but always bring the conversation back to your child. An example would be if the educators begin to talk about reasons why they can't support your child to do something. So reasons may be they have other children in the room with significant needs or behaviors, uh, things like that. So, so that is certainly their perspective. That's their reality as well, but it's not supporting you and your child, and it's not supporting the problem solving process that should be happening. So just, just being sure to bring it back to um, the actual needs and best interests of your child will, will lead to that, those good discussions and, and problem solving processes. So here's an example of a one page profile. And it's really great if, if these can be written in, in your child's words. So there's three basic sections of the profile. So what's important to me, how best to support me, and things others like and admire about me. So if you can, and you can see right away, you know, this, this young man loves the Blue Jays. So that's something that, that anybody who would see this one page profile about your son would, would be aware of them. And then I, I just, I love that section around how others like and admire, or the things others like and admire about me. And, and again, it comes from the point of view of the child. So this is just a really good um, one pager that can be kept up to date, kept with you. It, it would be perfect to give to the schools and, and say, make sure that the supply teacher um, receives this so it can go right into the supply plans. Um, 
community members, um, any coach it would be helpful to provide to. So it's just a real positive way to present your child. So as I mentioned, there were some things I wish that I had, had done a little more of in my years as special education resource teacher. And, and one thing is to have really solid conversations around social health and wellness of, of each child. And we know the importance now, and I think we've always known um, of just, just the importance of social re relations, social interactions for, for mental health and, and physical health. Um, so it's in, so requesting to discuss these at, at, at any meeting that you, you could have with your, your school is really helpful for your child now and in the future. So social health just simply refers to how is your child doing at forming relationships with others? Um, you could discuss things like, do they need opportunities or any other types of support in order to form relationships? And what we find with children specifically that have educational assistance support is sometimes these adults can actually be a barrier to the children forming relationships. Um, so you don't want that to happen. And then what happens as well is um, educational assistants come and go, children establish a relationship with these individuals that they believe is a true personal relationship, but then they end up grieving when, when that um, individual leaves. So it can really be almost a cycle of grief for your child. Um, as great as it is to have one educational assistant connected to your child that knows your child well, it, it doesn't really help in in your child being able to build other relationships and become more independent of, of these individuals. Social wellness refers to just the positive connections that your child has with other people, friends, teachers, um, just how, how are those connections? Who are they with? Uh, is your child presenting um, support to other people who's supporting your child? Just conversations around that will, will help to um, help everybody understand exactly where they are socially. Some basic tips just for documenting meetings then is, is after the meeting, send, send a follow-up email to the school team. And I do this all the time after any meeting I have. So just basically a quick thank you for, for your time to, to talk with us. And then a summary of all the discussion points with any follow-up items. So that's, so, so then you know, and the school knows what everybody is, is responsible for doing and, and there's no balls drop then. And I also recommend that, I know as a busy, busy parent, it's often hard, but you know, to try to stay organized and it's really helpful to keep two separate binders so one binder being all of that information that's about your child. So specifically outside of the school. So your child's history, if there are any reports, you know, from, from birth or um, medical practitioners, any assessment reports, any community reports that, that you would have can go within that binder. So you're really building a history of your child. And then the other binder could be for, for school documents like report cards, individual education plans, any IPRC documents. And, and just being able to have all of those at hand um, is, is really helpful. So as far as main takeaways go then, um, I'd really like you to remember that every meeting certainly is an opportunity to advocate and that you as your child's parent are an essential member of your child's education team. Uh, talk about your child's social health and wellness with, with the school team, document and stay organized and don't wait to advocate. So don't wait until there are difficulties going on um, and then start advocating. Advocate continue on a continual basis. And I'd like to thank you all for watching and thank Gluckstein Lawyers for providing this opportunity to support um, children and families. I think it's absolutely awesome. And I'd like you to please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, yeah. 
I'm here and there's my email address and my phone number. Thanks and all the best. I'm thrilled to be having Sarah Pott joining us today. Sarah Pott is a parent and caregiver of four in a family that lives with disability. She is also a writer and a family advocate supporting families through Empowered Kids Ontario. In addition to working as a community of belonging liaison with Christian schools in Ontario, she is currently enjoying the opportunities um, co-instructing a family engagement and research course, a collaborative offering from CanChild, Kids Brain Health Network and McMaster University. Hi there, my name is Sarah Pott and it's an honor to share with you from St. Catharines, Ontario, which is built on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people. I desire to live by and honor the two row treaty. And I've been asked to present on the topic of community and peer support to debate today. And my words will be for both the parent and caregiver as well as the organization. Want the elevator summary? We can't go it alone. When families have the opportunity to connect with others, everyone is impacted. Flourishing families come from connected communities and authentic engagement. But here's the catch. We've got to go slow to go far. And let me go even slower here for a moment and introduce myself. My name is Sarah Pott <clears throat> and I am the primary caregiver to my children. My husband, Ralph, and I have four, Emily, Sophia, Rachel, and Yannicka. Emily and Sophia are creeping slowly into adulthood. So today I'll, just, I'll share specifically about Rachel and Yannicka. Rachel is 15 and Yannicka is 12. Both radiate joy when wheeled into the room. Yet both have tested our faith and our strength. They were born with significant needs that ultimately can be described as global developmental delay. And we are now one of three families in the world that carry the diagnosis of Chidiat Hall syndrome. Rachel and Yannicka require complete care. They're non-speaking, unable to talk, cognitively delayed and unable to feed by mouth. So they're connected to their feed pumps 24 seven and to their parents. I'm a writer and presenter on the intertwined topic of faith and disability. I have a special passion for facilitating and I believe in the gift and value of education. We're all forever learning. I'm currently hired to support Christian schools in their work with students with disabilities. I'm on the instructor team with the family engagement and research course offered through CanChild, Kids Brain Health Network and McMaster University. And in addition to sitting uh, as an online support parent with the Niagara Children's Center, I also am on the board of directors with Empowered Kids Ontario. Does that context help frame your thinking for this presentation? Did you need to know that in order to hear my words? Sometimes I wonder if we worry too much about validation and I'll be the first to say that I'm not the one with the answer. In fact, I find the older I get, the more questions I have. And one question I have been wondering, what really matters? Does it matter that we have all these credentials? What matters when we connect with others? What matters when we create relationships? This is a good question to ask in this particular context, as a parent, as a caregiver, or as an organization. Can we truly get to the heart of what matters when we talk about community and peer support? I like how author Pauline Boss puts it. It's not the question of having the right answer, we must keep creating the best possible answer for the moment and know that the process will not stop as long as we live. Now, she's actually referencing ambiguous grief, which is actually a place that we need to start. This is where we need to start in this conversation about community and peer support. You see, we can create all kinds of programs, join all kinds of groups, but in my experience, if we don't start with the hard and sometimes messy first step, all those plans will fall short. And as parents and caregivers, we know isolation all too well. For many of us, welcoming a child with a disability into the family creates a new kind of normal and one that is very different from what our extended family or our friends experience. 
we don't have much time to process what's happening on a deeper level. We're often already too busy going to appointments, managing the day to day and keeping ourselves upright. So what does this have to do with ambiguous grief? This kind of grief can be helpful to explain all those complicated feelings that might crowd your head and heart. Ambiguous grief can catch you off guard in the middle of whatever is going on. And suddenly you're sad, overwhelmed, or not even certain of how you feel. In the given day, you might have that struggle with meaning where you're either feeling hope or despair or hope and despair and that you are finding ways to invest while at the same time just protesting what's happening. The feelings of sadness that have no explanation, that's ambiguous grief. The feelings of guilt or shame that have no right to be there are there. And let's be clear, dreams and ideas have died. That's hard. You're in a new kind of normal that isn't familiar and that's hard. So there's grief ambiguous grief. And if you're an organization attending this session, it's critical for you to know this. Many parents and caregivers are dealing with complicated emotions that might emerge as prickly behavior or poor response in gate or engagement. They're not giving you trouble. They're experiencing trouble. It's complicated. I remember a phone conversation I had with a seasoned mom a number of years ago. I think Rachel wasn't even one her children were much older than mine. Her children also had uh, some significant disabilities. And she told me in that phone call that as much as I might think I'm managing okay, there's gonna come a time when I'm gonna need help. And if I didn't make time to let others in my life and reach out to find others in that moment, I'd be isolating myself later. I never forgot that call. Now, some of us as parents or caregivers might be reaching out for that support because we just need to spill. <laughs> we just want to take all that hurt and frustration and put it on somebody else, get it out and get it out. Then there are those of us as parents or caregivers who don't want to let others in. We don't want to spend time being vulnerable. That's exhausting. Or risk letting someone in who's just going to let us down. Some of us might be bottling our emotions, stuffing them until something small triggers an explosion. And others of us might be brooding over our emotions, fixating on our sorrow, not seeing or talking about anything or anyone else. I've heard it said there's no gentle shift from physical exhaustion to emotional exhaustion. We don't get to choose. A lot of us are feeling both all the time at the same time. Renee Brown talks about the gift of storytelling and how it can help us impose order on chaos. We want to create a narrative that somehow will help us create sense of what feels messy and unfamiliar. And I'm wondering how can you as a parent or a caregiver learn to tell your story to help create some sense of what feels messy or unfamiliar? Maybe it's a video, a TikTok, a handwritten letter to yourself 10 years from now. Or how can you as an organization facilitate the process for parents and caregivers to learn to tell their stories? Can you create some ideas with lead parents and caregivers on what that might look like? Maybe it's a workshop or a conference that includes different ways to tell a story. Maybe it's a mentorship program that coaches families and caregivers in helping other families and caregivers. I say all of this because I believe firmly and have heard from numerous people that when families and caregivers have the chance to talk through or tell their story, they're in a healthier place to seek and offer connection. I'm going to say that again. When families and caregivers have the chance to talk through or tell their story, they're going to be in a healthier place to seek and offer connection. So then community and peer supports can help continue with that storytelling. So what does community and peer support look like? If we think it's gonna be a prescribed formula or program, we're forgetting how human we are. Just as we can say, you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism, there's no tidy forever answer to this question. There's no one program that suits all the needs in your community. Authentic community and peer support is co-designed 
with parents and caregivers and it's parent and caregiver led. It evolves with and responds to the needs and challenges that it holds and it's not perfect. I'm reminded of a dentist experience I had several years ago with my two girls. I saw the advertisement from a local new dentist who was saying his services were specific to children with disabilities. I thought I'd go check him out. So I took my girls in their wheelchairs to his clinic and certainly the place was physically accessible for the wheelchairs. But I have to admit the vibe in the office wasn't very welcoming. I actually felt like they weren't exactly happy to see me, two kids, wheelchairs. I actually returned to my former dentist their physically inaccessible office was much more welcoming. Though there wasn't an automatic door opener, there were helping hands opening the door. And though it was tricky to navigate through the narrow hallways and the dentist chairs, there were so many helping hands ready to make it work. So I guess what matters? A perfect place that's created to be accessible, but no welcoming experience or a less than perfect place that might even be frustrating at times, but it's always welcoming. What really matters? And may I add to that? Trust, courage, the willingness to be vulnerable, all of that play key roles in creating or accessing support. It's not perfect, it might be messy, but when we can create safe, predictable places where we can learn to trust each other, where we can develop courage and have the willingness to be vulnerable, Therein lies some powerful connection with community and peer support. For parents and caregivers, we can learn to do hard things. And we can learn to let others in. We've got to start small and maybe with just one idea. We've got to give it time and we need to try it a few times. Maybe it's a connection at the park. You see a parent struggling with some of the same stress you have at the park. Maybe it's a conversation at the sidewalk. Maybe it's shopping at Sobeys on a Wednesday night, and no, Sobeys didn't tell me to say this, but they do offer a sensory sensitive shopping experience. And maybe that's the night to go get your groceries and have a conversation with someone while picking out the bananas. Local libraries and recreational centers are slowly learning to offer specific events that support children with disabilities. And they're often in partnership with the local children's treatment center or a diagnosis specific chapter such as Autism Ontario. And these opportunities, though tricky for travel and logistics with managing everybody, they are great experiences to connect with others. In addition, organizations like Community Living can offer programs and connections. Let's face it, online is probably one of the best places to access network, networks and, can, and connections, particularly if you're looking for others with a similar diagnosis. As in our case, we'll be looking for a global connection. And yes, you can create a profile on Facebook and not have to friend your aunt's neighbor or share pictures of your meal to join the support networks that have Facebook pages. There are now pages for almost anything, the undiagnosed, the diagnosis, diagnosis specific, tube feeding, behavioral concerns, equipment, just to name a few. In addition to Facebook and other related social media sites, there are websites up, set up for connecting families. Courageous Parents Network is based in the US and it offers that global connection. Partners for Planning is based in Canada for Canadian families and offers a wealth of resources with videos and as you saw, as you can see circled family network links. And then there's good old Ontario 211. Type in your locale, type in your theme and up come connections that are posted online, giving you a chance or at least a place to start. Several of Ontario's children's treatment centers have private online Facebook groups specifically designed for their families and caregivers. And this is also the case growing with children's hospitals that their certain clinics are also offering private groups. And I can tell you that online connection is valuable. I know it's not in person, but it's valuable. I've witnessed many moments of connection between families and caregivers. I'm just thinking of one from a few weeks ago in a private Facebook group that I'm a part of where a mom needed a listening ear and created a pretty vulnerable post. But what followed in minutes was a thread of encouragement from different members in the group. It was very powerful to read. Several years ago, true story, 
I remember working with, I was in St. Catharines and I remember working with a mom in downtown Toronto and together using Facebook Messenger, we found a way to remove a pistachio from her son's G-tube. For those of you that have the family or respite support to step away from the home, conferences about disability that host clinicians, medical staff and researchers are now also making room for families and caregivers. Most of these conferences will offer a separate lower price for families and caregivers, and some offer the opportunity at no cost. There's no harm in asking. Maybe you never thought yourself to be the conference type, but these events are great places to connect. So what does authentic community and peer support look like from a planning perspective? First things first, it honors the phrase, nothing about us without us. Five words, nothing about us without us. If you're making plans as an organization to offer support to families and caregivers, invite them to join you in the planning process and reimburse them for their time. Starting with an online group doesn't take much work, but you'll need to create terms of reference and guidelines. Though online support comes with some risk as it is the internet, choosing spaces that are private or closed, such as on Facebook, and employing trustworthy administrators of the group helps. Some of the opportunities I've seen work include informal meetups at a coffee shop for parents and caregivers who have childcare arranged or kids in school. For those who have their kids with them, informal meetups at a park or on Zoom also work. Again, these have been designed by families and caregivers for families and caregivers. The Niagara Children's Center created a monthly event with some lead parents called Parent Talk that's been well received. A social worker or presenter might offer some tidbits on a specific topic for the first few minutes of the time scheduled, and then the rest of the time, the majority of the time, is spent in informal conversation led by a support parent who facilitates the conversation with those in attendance. And what's been so amazing is that these Parent Talks have created friendships those who have come and attended have gotten to know each other and then have, have created friendships outside of Parent Talk, and that's awesome. Creating a peer mentorship program is also valuable. Talk with organizations that already have such a program in place and learn their best practice. Niagara Children's Center has just started theirs, and they gained insight from other programs such as the Children's Treatment Network. I'd like to touch back on Pauline Boss's comment. We must keep creating the best possible answer for the moment and know the process will not stop as long as we live. The idea of creating the best possible answer for the moment is important to remember when creating community and peer support as an organization. Know that the needs are going to evolve for families over time due to growth and development of the children, changes in family dynamics, changes in culture, and heck, a pandemic can throw any and all great plans into a mess. But what keeps the community and peer support authentic is the connection and the culture created by everyone involved. Dr. Eric Carter has published some work around belonging that offers 10 elements to belonging. Based on research with children, youth, and adults with disabilities, he's pulled out these 10 elements as an organization, I might take some of these elements or all of them or one at a time and ask the question, how does somebody know they're welcomed in our environment, whether it be the center, whether it be your peer support or your community support? Or I might ask the parent or caregiver directly, how do you know you're welcomed in our center or in our program? Learn from those answers, learn from asking those questions about what is actually happening and is what you're creating meeting a need because that matters. We want it to be authentic. We want it to be real and we want it to be helpful. Further to the point of helpful language and these elements of belonging, we wanna think of how we are talking with each other, asking questions and then using phrases that don't shut down the conversation or maybe try to fix the problem, but invite more conversation. Phrases like this on the slide can actually create further connection, such as my favorites, tell me more or help me understand. These phrases and Gottman Institute has some great infographics are helpful for continuing the conversation and building the connection. 
because I want to touch on this idea of tokenism. We don't want to fix something. We don't want to create something for the sake of fulfilling a point on a strategic plan. We don't want to do something because we think we should. We want to create real opportunity for real connection. We want to keep it real. We want to be real. Otherwise, it's not going to last. And for some of us as parents and caregivers, reaching out and making connections is exhausting. On top of the already demanding goals we have, I saw this quote on Twitter and I, it kind of made me laugh because it's true. Shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. So parents and caregivers, let's ask ourselves what, what matters and challenge ourselves to take a small step because it isn't just about us feeding off of a connection. We also have a lot to offer other families and caregivers out there looking for connection. Let's allow some trusted adults and others into our life to build our team, to surround our child. And for organizations, the challenge is then to offer safe, predictable, consistent, and co-designed opportunities for connection. For all of us, it's so important that we remember we've got to go slow to go far. We're not going to look for miracles overnight. We're going to trust the timing and check in with each other and keep trying because organizations and ordinary people can create social connections and social connections help foster strength and courage, which is a win for families and caregivers and the children and youth they care for, a win for our regions and a win for our planet. We can't go it alone. Before I leave this session, I wanna end with Brené Brown's video on empathy. It's received 17 million views, so maybe you're one of the 17 million, but I think she sums up this idea of empathy so well and how it feeds into this idea of authentic community and peer support. So I'm going to set up the video and I hope you can enjoy it. And if you've seen it before, pay attention to the language that she references. It's so helpful to hear this over and over. So bear with me for just a moment while I unplug my headset so you can hear it. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> No, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, 
I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. All the best in your work as an organization and strength to you as parents and caregivers. Let's look for connection. Let's be willing to connect and let's keep it real. Take care.
Our next speaker is Donna Thompson. Uh, I also got to know Donna Thompson a number of years ago. Um, actually, before I ever met Donna, I had read um, a book that she had written um, called The Four Walls of Our Freedom um, about her son um, and um, their journey um, with his diagnosis and caring for him. Um, he does have um, a son, she does have a son, sorry, with cerebral palsy. And so, you know, it was amazing when I had read this book, it just gave me such incredible insights um, and information and um, a little bit of peace of mind uh, that I could get through this. Uh, and then years later, our paths crossed as we became involved with uh, a number of different research initiatives and um, family advisory committees. So it is my absolute pleasure um, to have Donna here speaking with us today. And as I said, Donna Thompson is a caregiver. She's an author and an activist. Um, she's the mother of two grown children, uh, one of whom, um, as I said earlier, has cerebral palsy and medical complexity. Donna is the co-author with Dr. Zachary White of The Unexpected Journey of Caring, The Transformation of Loved One to Caregiver. Um, she's the author of The Four Walls of My Freedom that I had uh, talked about earlier, um, which is lessons I've learned from a life of caregiving. She blogs regularly at the Caregiver's Living Room. Um, Donna is the past vice chair of Kids Brain Health Network and is a leader and instructor in family engagement in health research. She is a co-designer and co-instructor of the Family Engagement Research course and the facilitator of the Caregiving Essentials course, both at McMaster University. For the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, Donna sat on the expert group on home and community health care, the advisory committee for the white paper on aging, and the working group on complex care for adults with developmental disabilities. And so you can see why I'm very excited to have her joining us today. Hi. I'm Donna Thompson, and I am just delighted to be with you today. I am going to be talking today about um, life beyond trauma, uh, PTSD, and complex care. So like all of you, I am a parent of a young man with disabilities. Our Nicholas is 33 years old, actually. I can't even believe I'm saying that. And... Um, He's doing very well now, um, lives in a medical group home near us in Ottawa um, with 24-hour one-to-one nursing care. But for 23 years, we ran um, what I would describe as a home ICU type setting for him at home. And he has had many, many medical challenges, chronic pain, um, epilepsy, multiple seizures, uh, and a variety of other complex health challenges. So um, I became interested in the trauma that we parents um, experience in the course of caring for our uh, neurodiverse children. And so I became uh, a parent partner on a research project that is funded partially by IWK Hospital in Halifax, uh, the Child Bright uh, Strategy for Patient Oriented Research um, Network, uh, and also um, in conjunction with the Strongest Families Neurodevelopmental Program. So uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about my experience with PTSD and trauma, and also a little bit about what I learned as a parent partner on this uh, wonderful research project. So this is my family, and um, that's me and my husband, Jim Wright, and our daughter, Natalie, um, who's 29 now, and our Nicholas. He's a happy, wonderful person has a great life, by the way. Um, although he was, um, he became uh, a patient on palliative care in 2004, um, when he was having a huge number of uh, challenges that we weren't able to meet um, medically at that time, um, especially to do with uh, his overnight respiration and also his um, chronic pain. But uh, luckily, with a lot of bed rest these days and fantastic care, constant care, awake bedside nursing, he is doing really well, as you can see. Um, he is medically complex. Uh, this picture was taken um, 
uh, in the UK after his uh, very first orthopedic surgery. Um, if you have a child with cerebral palsy, you will recognize this broomstick casting. Um, it's done when uh, heel cords and um, uh, hamstrings are lengthened and they cast his feet to um, stretch out his uh, heel cords. Um, he, didn't, he did not do well in this surgery, a terrible post-op um, seizures triggered by pain and spasm. Um, and we know now that his sensory integration issues uh, make it almost impossible for him to be in a plaster cast. Um, so he is visits the ICU quite often. Um, and this was last year when he developed um, septic shock with an infected gallbladder. That was a very complicated um, surgery and course of um, hospitalization requiring um, uh, sedation and intubation in the ICU. So um, I just wanna make sure I'm on the right side slide here. There we go. So what is PTSD anyway? PTSD is actually a problem of memory. And this is what happened to me. So, and I did not know that I had PTSD, but when I tell you what happened, I'm sure that you're gonna say, oh my gosh, I have had something like that happen to me too. Um, because many of us, have had uh, the types of um, maybe life-threatening um, experiences with our children, or we've witnessed something that um, was very traumatic in their lives, or we've had something in our own lives previous to having children that somehow gets connected in our memory with what's going on with our kids with disabilities today. So um, what happened was, um, this slide says Morgan, but actually it's me, Donna. <laughs> um, so what happened was that um, my father um, was had three strokes when I was a teenager and he was paralyzed and had lost his speech. And I was at home alone with him one day and he happened to be sitting in the chair in the living room. And I was down the hall in my bedroom and I heard a funny sound in the living room coming from my dad and I ran down the hall and I saw my father um, very uh, stiff. Um, uh, his head was thrown back, his eyes were rolled back, he was shaking and I thought that he was having another stroke and I thought that I was witnessing my father dying. Um, and so it turned out that it was not a stroke, it was a seizure, but I had never seen a seizure before. So fast forward to 1990 and um, Nicholas was two years old and it was his very first day at preschool. Um, and he, uh, I got a call and I was having my coffee and a newspaper and it was like the first five minutes of respite, you know, that I had had since he was born, um, his very first day of school in a very special, um, preschool for children with disabilities that admitted them at age two. And, um, so I got uh, the phone rang. And I picked it up and it was the director of the school. And she said, Nicholas has had a seizure. He's on his way to the hospital and currently he is not responsive. And I, I, I didn't know what to do, but my mind went back to that moment in the hallway with my father. I thought that Nicholas was going to die right then and there. So I jumped in the car, I drove to um, the emergency room and I 
And as soon as I walked through the double doors, I could hear him howling and I knew he was okay. But after that, every single time the phone rang, and I'm talking about for years after, the phone would ring and I would think Nicholas was going to die because the phone rang. And this got mixed up in my head for a long time. And I really didn't exactly know what was happening. All I knew was that my heart would pound and I would be filled with fear and dread every single time the, the telephone rang. And I learned, um, you know, this year at age 66, that that is PTSD in parenting a neurodiverse child. So the actual definition of a traumatic event in the DSM, which is the medical guidebook of every uh, diagnosis, is that exposure to actual or threatened death, serious illness, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. So you can directly experience it yourself. You can witness it. You can hear about it or learn about it, um, that something awful has happened to a close family member. In this case, let's think about our children. Um, or you experience repeated or extreme exposure to um, aversive details of the traumatic event. So sometimes this happens when we have to repeat our medical histories at the hospital. Think about that. We do this all the time, right? So individuals with PTSD have never left the traumatic scene. We keep going back and visiting it and we are stuck in the event. The threat feels ever present and we remain in um, hypervigilant fight or flight survival mode. And the traumatic event can be our constant reality or it can be our constant visitor. Um, and the present reality can sometimes in severe cases of PTSD, the present reality seems like a dream or an illusion. You know, something really important about the way trauma works um, that I learned this year that explains so much for, for my own experience uh, is that, that life-threatening events um, are like stones you carry. So you don't get better at managing traumatic events with the more traumatic events that you experience. You get worse at managing them because they start as a, they can start as a small single challenge that you, or traumatic event that you have to deal with, but you keep adding on, layering on more traumatic events and that weight of um, trauma on your back gets heavier and heavier and it will eventually bring you to your knees. So the actual, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the actual study. Um, it's finished now, sadly, you can't apply to be part of it, unfortunately, but I think we can learn a lot from, from this study, and I certainly did. Um, so the aims of this study were to, to gain more knowledge about trauma and mental health of children with um, neurodiverse uh, you know, disabilities, and um, to develop and provide an intervention, that means a treatment uh, tailored to the needs of parents, and to demonstrate uh, its feasibility and effectiveness of that treatment or intervention. Um, and unfortunately, I've got the website here, but the website crashed and they can't get it back, unfortunately. So, um, but the good news is that there are going to be some papers published um, quite soon uh, about this study. So keep, uh, keep an eye out. Um, so the first thing that we did was we surveyed parents. Uh, we surveyed for, um, and these are all parents of children with um, uh, developmental disabilities and, um, uh, or, and also um, parents who 
were not self-defining as having complex care needs, or they weren't self-identifying as having PTSD. They were just all parents of neurodiverse kids. We got as many as we could, and there were over 400 respondents to the survey. So we asked about traumatic experiences, PTSD symptoms, barriers to accessing any kind of mental health support, social support, and we asked about the parent-child relationship. And the actual treatment or the intervention um, was called ENET. So um, it's a type of therapy um, that's conducted online. So it's virtual one-to-one -one, um, with a trauma coach. And this was a trained coach, but not a medical professional, not a, not a psychologist, but under the supervision of a psychologist, trained trauma coaches. So we were really interested in this um, uh, treatment um, type of delivery uh, because it's a lot cheaper than using medical professionals. And we want as many people who need this kind of intervention to have it. So um, we focused on the traumatic experiences and, um, it, and this whole uh, approach to treatment using coaches online is absolutely based um, in evidence. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a type of trauma therapy that is proven to work. So it's called narrative exposure therapy. And there were eight to 12 sessions, each of 90 minutes. And um, they, the coaches did something with everybody participating in this um, called a lifeline. And the, the lifeline is a visual rope that represents your life. And um, flowers represent happy times, Stones represent traumatic experiences. Um, and I can't remember what else is there. That's basically it. Oh, um, candles, sadness. I think the candles represent something that's sad, but not necessarily traumatic. So um, you can see what happens here. This is plotting your life so that you can reorganize your memories so they're not piled on top of each other and getting all mixed up. And as I said, we had over 400 people responding to um, the survey and um, uh, 50 parents, approximately 50 parents went through the actual treatment. They, the parents who were chosen to go through the treatment or who volunteered, um, had significant PTSD, all our parents of children with disabilities. And, um, and the people who would not be accepted, like the exclusion criteria, we said, no, you cannot participate in this study, would be if they were having acute psych symptoms, or they were actively suicidal, or they had severe dissociation where they just could not have a you know, a conversation about their trauma. So the lessons learned, this is so interesting. We learned that, yep, it, you can do trained um, coaching, trauma coaching uh, virtually and do this type of therapy. The challenges, you know, in our population of parents, we have parents whose kids go to the hospital go to the emergency room, end up being admitted, and then they're not available for the, for the therapy. Um, uh, and they have to stop it because their kid is sick. So, or new traumatic events um, and, or the loss of the, the loss of beloved persons during the intervention. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 really got in the way because um, homeschooling was such a, terrible pain in the neck for, 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 for anyone who was trying to care for a child with developmental disabilities and homeschool them with no respite and no help. 
So it was pretty impossible to focus on your own mental health with 90 minute sessions um, under such circumstances. But we did have 50 people who managed to get through the program. Um, I just really want to um, also uh, talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, this program is not available yet, but we are trying to get it uh, into the mainstream and to make it available through provincial governments. And we're working with the Strongest Families Neurodevelopmental Program, um, which is uh, it's a different program, but it also helps families using coaches online. And it's really a parenting program. Um, so it's not, it's nothing to do with PTSD, but it is um, an organization that is set up to offer help virtually um, to parents of children with disabilities. So we're hoping it's not, nothing is, is sealed and, and delivered yet, but we are hoping um, that Strongest Families will be a partner, that provincial governments will step up and make this kind of help available to uh, parents who need it, parents who are suffering from symptoms of PTSD. Um, you know, the other, um, the other thing I wanted to quickly mention before we move into a QA and a as, as well is that this type of therapy is, is scary. Um, it is not easy to say, yes, I will, with a coach, revisit the worst days in my life. Um, and I know people whom I knew personally could really benefit from a program like this, but they said no. They cannot, they cannot imagine trying to uh, go back there to the darkest days and the darkest places. So fear, I think, is a huge barrier. Um, but I have to say that some of the initial feedback that we've had from the people who went through this um, was that it was surprisingly not as hard as they thought, because the lifeline separates the, the events of your life and puts them together with some of the great things that happened in your life. And it untangles one thing from another. So it unpacks that bag of rocks on your, on your back. It unpacks them and takes them out one by one to look at them and separate them. Um, I did not do uh, this program myself, um, simply because I, I, I'm just going to admit it, I was too busy. I was too busy to do the program. They did offer it to me, um, but I'm not suffering anymore from the PTSD symptoms that I used to. Uh, so I thought um, I, I, you know, that, that opportunity, unfortunately, passed me by. Um, but I remain a parent partner on the project and a co-author of the papers that are going to be published about this study. And um, I'm just delighted and proud as, as Punch to be, to be part of it. Um, so if, uh, if there are any questions, and I bet there are, uh, I would love to have a conversation about all of this. Thank you so much. Dr. Pradeep Merchant obtained his medical degree from the University of Bombay and completed his pediatric training at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and later joined the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto for a neonatology fellowship. He then joined the University of Ottawa's Department of Pediatrics as an assistant professor and was later appointed chief of the Division of Neonatology at what is now the Ottawa Hospital, Civic Campus, um, and medical director of the Rich Little Special Care Nursery. In 2006, Dr. Merchant became chief of the Division of Neonatology for the Amalgamated Ottawa Hospital and then chief of the Division of Neonatology at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, otherwise known as CHEO. 
Currently, he is the site chief of the Division of Neonatology at the Ottawa Hospital Civic Campus. Dr. Merchant continues to participate actively at local, regional, and provincial levels for the development of regional healthcare in Ottawa. And we are so happy to have him here today uh, to be able to present to all of you. So enjoy. Enjoy. 